with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, divisible, liberty, and justice for all. I knew I did something. Was it double? Slightly out of sync. Well, good evening once again and welcome, and uh, a special welcome to uh, our colleagues in the Boston Teachers Union here that are joining us this evening, as well as uh, President Tang and a number of your uh, uh, executive team. Uh, tonight's meeting is being broadcast live by Boston City TV on YouTube, as well as on Comcast Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Files Channel 1962. It will be rebroadcast at a later date. We have interpretation services available this evening in <coughs> Spanish. Would the Spanish interpreter please raise your hand and introduce yourself in Espanol. Gracias. If you'd like to sign up for uh, public comment this evening, please see our staff person, Ms. Lena Parvex, out in the hallway. Sign up for both public comment sessions will uh, end at 6.30 this evening. We'll move on now to approval of the minutes from the January 15th school committee meeting. If the minutes are approved as presented, hard copies will be made available in the hallway immediately after the vote. If uh, the minutes are changed, uh, you can access those minutes tomorrow on the BPS website. This time I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the January 15th meeting as presented. Thank you, uh, Ms. Robinson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? <coughs> Excuse me. Any objection to approving the uh, minutes by unanimous consent? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. We'll move on now to the superintendent's report. I present to you our superintendent, Dr. S uh, Brenna Caselius. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and I want to just take a moment to wish everyone a happy new year, Lunar New Year. We are uh, now in the year of the rat, which is associated with the hour before and after midnight. The rat typically represents new beginnings. And as we commence on strategic plan, there will be new beginnings here in Boston <laughs> Public Schools. I'm feeling a bit optimistic this uh, school year. I'd like to start with a few updates. Uh, as you know, uh, we had our first strategic planning uh, community review last week in Mattapan, and we'll have another review session tomorrow in East Boston. Uh, that will be our second, and we have two more after that, and these are just the formal hearings. You know, you all know how much engagement we've already done, but these are really the formal ones where we're giving uh, the community the, the ways in which they can provide formal feedback to us in written form, and we'll have, we have computers there and other ways, and that they can uh, provide feedback uh, to us. I've already met with several partners uh, who have uh, given us really, really good feedback. So I've started the strategic engagement process as well with, with uh, folks out in the community and getting, that, getting their support for our strategic plan and getting their uh, feedback. Had um, uh, Alex give me some really great feedback with some partners about uh, partnership and lifting that a little bit higher. So. We think that will bring um, some more recommendations around really calling out uh, philanthropy and foundations and nonprofit partners and, and how they can contribute and help us accelerate our strategic planning and success for our children. Uh, last Friday, I met with the superintendent student um, executive cabinet, which is just a highlight of my weeks when I get to meet with them. Uh, and they gave me really, really good feedback uh, on the strategic plan, especially around the items in the plan around mental health, high school redesign, uh, teacher diversity, and also uh, customer service. And so it was great to have the youth feedback um, uh, in the strategic plan from the youth executive cabinet as well as BSAC. In addition, um, I wanted you all to know that as we begin to think about strategic planning, I'm also thinking about strategically um, alignment and capacity at the central office. So I've begun meeting with our departments and looking um, and getting feedback from our individual department uh, heads and uh, all of the staff within those departments so that we can better align and restructure and provide the supports so that we can actually implement the plan uh, well. 
So uh, that will also inform uh, the operational plans that we put together and present to you in the future as we continue to work on the strategic planning. I want to uh, thank everyone in the audience who are here to talk about inclusion and um, getting that right for our kids. It's a huge part of our work with providing services for our students uh, with disabilities, as well as all students uh, in, in the general ed classroom and in the community as a whole within our learning environments. And so I want to just give you an update that we have been meeting with the Inclusionary Task Force since, I believe, September. And uh, we've been meeting monthly and bringing recommendations and reviewing data and reviewing programs and discussing that. This past month, uh, Monday, I brought forth recommendations on a staffing uh, model, and we are in the process of continuing to collaborate on what that model should be and can be, as well as a process for collaboration uh, with our collab process and how we might resolve differences at schools for specific students and, um, and the needs that they have specifically at the school. It's my goal that these uh, conversations will uh, come to resolution uh, soon and hopefully be ready for you uh, with the budget um, as we begin to think about how we push out supports to our teachers um, and, and our students so that they can thrive in these inclusion settings. Um, also, I wanted to provide and thank Jessica Tang for being here from the union. Uh, also, I want to um, give recognition for our psychologists. I want to congratulate Andrea Amador and the whole behavioral health services team for earning proficient recognition by the National Association of School Psychologists. The behavioral health department was commended for a well-organized, comprehensive, and planful approach in the delivery of school psychological services across the district. The NASP also noted that for a large district, there is a great deal of structure and self-assessment to ensure consistency and fidelity of services. Strong community partnerships represent a significant and notable strength. The NASP also recognized the district for advocating for school psychologist services and working to increase the number of school psychologists uh, able to broadly practice and meet student needs. Fantastic work by the team, and I want to give them congratulations. <laughs> As you may have read in the paper, and um, uh, we have our DESI review that we are undergoing, and was that me? Yes. Okay, got it. Um, earlier this year, the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, conducted a comprehensive review of our schools, visiting over 100 of our schools and classrooms, um, and then also interviewing uh, parents, stakeholders, and uh, central office staff. So we are going to be receiving that review uh, in the next couple of weeks here. Uh, I talked to the commissioner and he said we would receive it mid-February uh, for our opportunity to review it for factual um, feedback and uh, make sure that it is accurate. I look forward to getting this review and having that complement the work um, that I did with my team this fall and going out and visiting schools, talking to teachers, uh, and getting kind of the external cross-reference to the personal reference that I have from all of the feedback that I've been able to get and that has um, provided input into the strategic planning. So it will be useful for us uh, as another um, check on uh, how well we're doing in the health of the system and things that we need to do in terms of um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just give you a few build PPS updates before our big update in April. Um, I received a number of emails from the Charlestown community um, anxious about uh, the Edwards School and the Warren Prescott um, and the Charlestown High School and what's happening in that community in terms of enrollment. Um, I have responded to all of those and uh, shared with them that myself and Tommy Welsh will be out there meeting with the community about what's going to be happening and starting that planning and hopefully by April we'll have recommendations for you with the overall recommendations for the next steps with Build PPS. This is true also as we begin to plan with the Roslindale community members about their K-6 expansion. Um, so there's going to be some heavy engagement over the next um, several months to work with communities to see if we can find resolution to expand those K-6s and accelerate the pathway um, work that we've been able to do in East Boston. Uh, families uh, have asked me for that. 
and as much as we can, we want to be able to try to do that in a timeline that makes sense for families as soon as possible. Um, also met with the Andrew Jackson community and the Horace Mann communities recently, and we continue to meet with them about the, um, the Andrew Jackson site there in the Horace Mann School. Uh, they want a separate school centrally located for their deaf and hard of hearing students. So we continue to look for that and they will need a swing space next year. So uh, hopefully by April we'll have some more, um, not next year, the year after, the following year, correct. Yep, the, not the following. So we'll have time um, to begin that design um, So and identify the swing space for that. We've begun discussing with school leaders in our secondary schools, our high schools, and our middle schools around their transition to 712 because they'll have also a planning year in the next year. So I wanted to just make you aware that we have uh, begun those discussions with the middle and uh, secondary uh, high school t uh, principals, which will then um, now will begin speaking with the teaching staff and the school communities. So I just wanted to give you a heads up that we're going to be starting to talk with them about um, about those shifts to that pathway. Um, as, pre as previously mentioned as well, McCormick and BCLA merger, uh, they are on hold for this year. Uh, we'll continue to plan with uh, BCLA and McCormick in terms of the building and their swing space for the upcoming year as well. So those are things that will be coming. Um, I know we've had uh, community members from Be It Aid come about the K-2 uh, dual language program. And um, we have been working with uh, their, their uh, community around trying to identify so that we can keep that cohort of kids together for that dual language program. It's a little bit complicated in the three sites that we're looking at right now, but we are trying to find and are committed to finding a space for that K-2 dual language program because we think it's really important to keep those children together. It's just trying to find the space to do so. So hoping to get them an answer as soon as possible for that community. Uh, we were able to finish the district calendar. Uh, moving on to that, uh, you have a copy of that. It is posted now on our website, um, and uh, we will have um, uh, the final up the final update. We've received a lot of inquiries recently from families and staff uh, about summer camp, asking about the first day of school. So we've uh, published that now, and it's available for download at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash calendar. Just a reminder that our calendar page is continuously being updated to include district events. Uh, in, in addition, we update the district calendar following any school cancellations such as a snow day on December 3rd. We are not calling a snow day because it's nice outside. Mm -hmm. Snow days are cancellations pushed back to the last day of school and that's currently uh, Monday, June 22nd of 2020. Now some highlights from the past couple of weeks. Um, there was a keynote address at BU, and um, I was asked to give the keynote address there. It was a wonderful day of celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday and honored um, him and his <coughs> wife, Coretta Scott King, um, and it was just an incredible day of celebration, and also uh, Sue Bailey Thurman and Aretha Franklin, so some good music, um, some good um, conversation, inspiring. It was very, very inspiring. Uh, afternoon. After the MLK uh, Day took place uh, at the Museum of Fine Arts where there was a winner of the King Boston Essay Contest was revealed. Congratulations to Amelia Sanchez, a sophomore at Boston Latin School, who took home first place for her essay which detailed the job discrimination that those with autism encounter. I'd like to read an excerpt from her essay. One issue that is particularly important to me is rarely addressed simply because there is still so much stigma and bias surrounding it that few people are willing to question, and that is staggering unemployment rate of individuals with high-functioning autism, with 85% of college graduates on the autism spectrum unemployed. This is economic injustice, and as a high-functioning autistic teen, this is unacceptable to me. I believe that if Martin Luther King Jr. was alive today, he would be working to change this, as he played a large part in fighting for the rights of those with disabilities, as well as, play, as, well as paying, playing his more, more well-known ro role as black rights activist. Capable people are being denied the American dream, not because of a lack of skills or ability, but because of deep-rooted bias against those who think differently. 
I want to thank Amelia for finding the courage to use your essay as an opportunity to advocate for the people of Autism Spectrum. You are truly an in inspirational young woman. We also have the first ever Youth Poet, poet, la poet Laureate announced. Congratulations are in order for Fenway High School junior Alondra Bobadilla, Bobadilla, who was recently named the City of Boston's first ever Youth post laureate, Poet Laureate. I don't know why I can't get that off of my, <laughs> my tongue today. Poet laureate. poet laureate. After the city put out a call for youth to apply, Alondra became one of the 10 semifinalists to participate in in-person interviews. From there, a selection committee narrowed down the application pool to three finalists where Alondra was ultimately selected. In the role, Alondra uh, will receive mentoring from City of Boston Poet Laureate, got it right, and will work to raise the uh, everyday consciousness of poetry among Bostonians. She will also have a workspace at the Boston Public Library and will publish a collection of poems. I, for one, cannot wait to read her poetry. I was uh, able to, uh, congratulations. Yes, thank you. I've also been trying to make it out to uh, fundraisers uh, for our schools and other events that schools host, because that's a lot of fun to do. And so I was able to go out to Perry Skate Night. Obviously, people know I love to skate. Um, another week, another opportunity to hit the ice with some of our students. I was so excited to join so many of our little sharks at the Perry School's third annual skate night at the Murphy Rink in South Boston last Saturday. It was great to see so many little skaters in one little rink <laughs> and some very experienced ones who almost knocked me down. Um, <laughs> and it was really fun as they had their little crates around and as they chased each other. Uh, Perry did a fant the parents did a fantastic job of making sure each child was accompanied on the ice uh, by a responsible adult. There were snacks, pizza, free skate sharpening and rentals, a whole lot of fun. Want to give a big sh shout out to the Murphy Rink for uh, their participation in the night. It was a great community building event and I can't wait till the next skate night. I was also able to attend um, the Black Coaches Classic. Um, it was just a great honor to be there on Sunday uh, to honor um, <coughs> Ms. Harris and uh, Mr. Charlie Titus. Um, there, our boys and girls basketball players were also there um, showing their skills. And it was just uh, wonderful to sit there and watch uh, some basketball and also to honor these great greats within our uh, community. They were given a certificate of recognition for their indelible impact on Boston and particularly our youth. Mr. Titus uh, was a standout on Boston Technical High School's basketball team back in the day and was a longtime UMass Boston coach. He currently is the vice <coughs> chancellor for athletics and recreation at UMass Boston. Ms. Harris, many of you know, is a former Boston School Committee member, Basketball Hall of Fame inductee. Yep. Um, and she also has a gymnasium name for her just a few uh, blocks away on Washington Street and she's the first female coach in UMass Boston uh, history. I was so happy to be there. <laughs> I was happy to be there because Ms. Harris especially has just been so supportive of me um, and someone for whom I have a, a great deal of admiration. So very much thank both of them for their commitment to our children. Um, last night, I had the great honor to finally, because we've been trying to get this on the books, <laughs> uh, spend the evening with the Greater Boston Latino Network. Uh, they gave me a beautiful reception. It was wonderful to connect with some of our wonderful, great um, Latino <coughs> uh, partners out in the community who do such um, amazing work with our youth um, and with our families. And uh, I want to thank Vice Chair Alex uh, Oliver Davila for joining us and helping co-host the evening. Um, we were joined by members of the EL Task Force, um, as well as Chief of um, Human S uh, Health and Human Services, Marty Martinez, and City Councilors Anissa Sabi george and Ken Zibach, and many other uh, amazing community members. I look forward, oh yes, and Carmen Ortiz was there as well. I look forward to a continued partnership with our Latinx community and nonprofits especially, as we uh, work to increase in support for our Latinx <coughs> students and families. And then just finally, I'd like to uh, thank 
Mr. O'Neill, uh, for his leadership and advocacy as Boston Public Schools was a Boston, the city of Boston, was chosen um, to host uh, the October 2024 Council of Great City Schools Annual Fall Con uh, Conference. That's uh, quite an honor to be able to host all of the large urbans here. Um, and hopefully by 2024, we will have much to share uh, with our new strategic direction within the, um, within the school district and within the community. So thank you for that, and thank you for your leadership on that. And that's my, that concludes my report. Well, thank you very much, Superintendent. I'll open it up now to members for questions or discussion. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Superintendent, first of all, thank you for calling out Ms. Amador and the whole team and the uh, recognition they were given by the National Association of School Psychologists. I actually spoke to them in, in D.C. a few years ago at their invitation about the comprehensive behavioral health model and was struck that Ms. Amador is actually a leader with them nationally and is extraordinarily well respected on a national level. So I'm glad to see that um, Boston's getting some recognition there. And also, thank you for your update about some of the communities particularly about Charlestown and uh, the Edward School and also the Horace Mann and, and Jackson Mann School. As we, I, I know how anxious you are to get to April and make big announcements. We, you're also learning how this city works that in the absence of information, misinformation takes hold. And so I, I know a lot of Charlestown people, I know because I live about five doors away from the Edward School mm -hmm. and the rumor was spreading that the building was gonna be sold and knocked down or mm -hmm. condos or whatever and that's the furthest from the truth. Of course, it's gonna be more um, Boston Public School seats. And so thank you for uh, you know, uh, agreeing to meet with the community. I'd like to join you for that. Um, and then also you've been uh, more proactive with the Horace Mann and the Jackson Mann community as well. Again, the same thing that folks started to think about, well, if we're not hearing what the plan is for the building, then that means the school's not going to exist. And of course, that's not the truth in the slightest. Horace Mann's 150-year-old leadership in yep. um, education for our students who are deaf and hard of hearing. And I know how committed you are to that. And, and as I said to that community, you're the first superintendent I've ever visited that school with who actually speaks ASL with the students. I know you claim you're not fluent in it, but um, you certainly understand the sensitivities of that community. So thank you for um, reaching out to folks and recognizing they need to hear some information. I know you are trying to be so careful because your word is your bond and you're trying not to say things you can't deliver on, but recognizing that there are steps you can take to get messages out to that community <coughs> helps build that trust when you say, wait till I have the bigger plan for you. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Dr. Rivera. Yes. So I just um, um, thank you for also um, coming to the Greater Boston Latino Network reception. Thank you. Um, I did want to ask about, you know, it was in the Globe today, <laughs> the article about um, the review by Riley. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about what role the school committee members will play in. Um, in addressing some of the concerns raised by the review. I'm just curious what our role would be and what m some next steps are gonna be regarding the, the review. Well, um, Ms. Rivera, I think, Dr. Rivera, I think what I will get the review and then I will be allowed to, with my team, make sure that it's just factually accurate. We can't change any of the intent of it or make any other changes other than to correct the facts um, and then provide supporting evidence if there's any disagreement around the facts. Um, and then I'll probably present a, uh, have a presentation for all of you on, on what that is. I think it would probably be important for you to see what's in it and be able to share with the committee and the public. It will be a public document. Um, they have to get it back from us and then they'll, I don't know when they'll release it, but they'll give me notice when they release it. Um, I might get notice that same day. Um, I'm not sure when they're planning on releasing it. I think we have 10 days in which to review it though. Okay. So, um, and then at that point, I think it's really um, our job to just continue to do our work of strategic plan and then the commissioner will decide what recommendations he might bring um, from the review. And I'll suggest, you know, as uh, uh, to your question about the role for the committee, um, you know, we expect to see that report. I'm not sure if we'll get a, a glimpse of that in draft form or not. Um, but once we uh, move through the report, 
our role as a committee is to oversee the policies of the district, uh, the budget for the district, and set the goals for the superintendent, among other things. And all of these are necessarily intertwined um, around the direction forward for this district. And that's um, been very artfully uh, expressed through the strategic planning process that the superintendent's um, engaged in over the last six months since she, uh, she came on board, as well as uh, what is uh, soon to kick <coughs> off in the budget process with uh, the um, new infusion of funding from the city uh, that we'll be talking about rolling out um, both this, uh, not only in this year, but in the future years as well. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for, um, just like any other report that uh, comes to this body, um, that speaks to the Boston Public Schools to take what it is that the state has learned from its review and uh, incorporate that in our thinking about how we move this district forward. I just, I was asking because I'm, you know, reading in the Globe, it makes it seem, oh, we're going to go into receivership. And so I'm just concerned about how we should be prepared for, for some type of intervention, if any intervention will come from the state. And maybe you don't have the answers for that, but. I don't have the answers. I've, I've, um, I know that the state has the authority to do that and has done that in other school districts. Um, I think that we have really gone above and beyond um, with the community to get their input into what they believe the school district needs to turn itself around and to improve the outcomes for children. Um, and the folks here today is a show of advocacy, you know, for for being able to build that strategic direction. And so it's my hope that because we've done this heavy lift over the past six months that they will recognize that work and see that we have a good plan of action um, moving forward and that we can actually govern ourselves. Thank you. And I'd suggest, you know, just harking back to my, my previous <coughs> comments, you know, we're, um, we're at a special point um, right now uh, in our district. Um, you know, and I think we're probably at a special point in education across the state, uh, generally given the uh, first time since 1993 we've had any meaningful change in the way in which we fund uh, schools across uh, the state through the uh, um, Student Opportunity Act. Uh, as we all know, I think as many of us know that are paying close attention, that'll take seven years to fully implement. Um, and at the same time, we've got a three-year um, acceler accelerated uh, investment that's coming from the city. And so I think, you know, we're at a point where we're taking stock of uh, what are the issues in this district that um, have really been persistent and we haven't been able to get out either by way of uh, the way that this, the district's been organized or funded or a combination of both. And now we have an opportunity with the funding right. and with a fresh start with the superintendent, with a fresh start with a, a clear uh, strategic plan that's community driven um, to, to really move this district forward. And, and so, um, you know, the state has its, its authorities, as the superintendent um, pointed out, uh, but nevertheless, we think we're in a good place and we've made a good faith effort uh, to demonstrate how we're going to uh, move this district forward. And, you know, we're, um, we think the state's full of reasonable people and they, they uh, are likely to agree. Thank you. Other questions? Did you have something additional, Mr. O'Neill, or no? Um, I was just choosing my words carefully. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I look forward to, you know, a lot of people in this audience have read the drafts of the strategic plan, as we all have. We've had numerous conversations <coughs> about it. You have you've, uh, did a tremendous amount of work, superintendent, to get ready for this point to present it. And what I am personally excited about is not only does it do it, does it, I believe, represent the community's viewpoint but it also ties, you're tying it together with the budget that you'll be presenting next week that combined with additional city funding is a chance to really bring it to action. So I trust when people read the full strategic report and see the budget that is tied with it, they'll have a sense that we have a very clear direction of where we're going. Combining it with conversations that we'll be having later on tonight <coughs> about your evaluation and how we'll be tracking data on it and what the right data points are and how we'll be evaluated on it, which is, Mr. Chair, as you point out, is our main role. Um, I trust by reading the full report and seeing the budget that's tied together with it and seeing how we're tracking against it, um, reasonable people will come to reasonable conclusions. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Vice Chair Alvarez. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> 
I'm not going to choose my words carefully. I'm just going to say that um, I do encourage, I, I, in, my, in reading that article, I was upset about um, the comments around the strategic plan <coughs> because there's a lot of work that has gone into the strategic plan that has included hundreds of voices of families, of students, of partners. Um, so I commend you on all that work and all the team, and I commend the community for participating and coming out. Uh, with that said, I just also wanted to thank you for uh, attending the Greater Boston Latino Network um, gathering. And we wanted to welcome you much earlier, but you were busy doing uh, all of your um, community-wide forums and listening to the community, so we're glad that we could finally make that happen. <laughs> I just wanted to um, also echo um, Mr. O'Neill's comments. Um, I really appreciate when in, this, um, in your superintendent reports when you actually address some of the things that are happening that people are talking about, so I just really appreciate that because I think it's really important for us to keep the community abreast of everything that's happening, that we're not trying to hide anything and we're trying to, you know, we're being transparent, so I really appreciate that. My only um, comment was going to be that um, as you have those meetings and as you move forward with the plans in those schools, again, we always think about schools as those four walls and it's so much more than that, so just again thinking about the different partners that are at those schools because you know, wherever people land, you know, wh what happens with those partners, um, for them to be aware too of what's happening yep. and to be included in those conversations. So thank you very much. Yep. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. Just one other thing I wanted to mention for uh, folks that have been following along as well as those are, that are in the audience this evening. Um, you may have noticed in the, um, the, the portion of uh, the superintendent's report this evening that focused on build BPS that uh, the, the Jackson Mann School was referred to specifically by the superintendent as the Andrew Jackson School on a few occasions. And that's actually come as a surprise to me that uh, we've named one of our schools uh, after uh, the former president. Um, and I, I always take this uh, an opportunity anytime I learn something new about a potentially objectionable uh, name uh, on any uh, school building, uh, but particularly our schools, to point out that we do have a policy uh, that the school committee has um, uh, promulgated a number of uh, years ago and was recently updated. It was actually recently used to name a playground at the, uh, the Higginson School uh, that allows um, community-driven name changes for school buildings across the district. And I want to note um, that, you know, that can come from a number of different places. That can come from uh, the surrounding community in a neighborhood. That can come from a school community. That can come from this body as well. Um, and I think, you know, as we become to, um, we, we have become more aware of um, the history that we have in our city and the way that uh, names have come about and what impacts that has on our population, mm -hmm. I think we need to be sensitive to what are the um, tools that we can uh, avail ourselves of uh, to change that history. And I want to uh, point out for folks uh, particularly that uh, when it comes to school names, uh, there is one group that's been working on this issue quite a bit, and that's, uh, forgive me if I, I mangle the name, but I believe it's the Boston uh, Women's Freedom Trail Network, or something to that effect. Uh, it's uh, led by an, a number of women from the city. Um, Meg Campbell, our former colleague, is, is uh, one of the folks leading the charge there, and they've identified uh, uh, that I believe out of the 125 schools in our district, uh, it's, it's in the single digits. I think it's eight or nine schools are named after women. Um, and so they have generated a list of historically significant women in this city uh, that I think might be ripe for naming a school after. Uh, and so if there are any school communities out there that are thinking about, are taking uh, an opportunity to examine the name of their school, their buildings, uh, their community centers, uh, we have an opportunity, we have a way to address that. And we encourage you to contact the committee uh, to learn more about that, you can contact Ms. Sullivan for a copy of that policy, and we'd be happy to work with you, and as, uh, particularly as we move through the build BPS process and uh, we perhaps um, see uh, schools combining, uh, new buildings being built, uh, buildings being reconfigured, we, we can take that as a positive opportunity to affect real change for history. Uh, Chair, I'm, I apologize. I just wanted to also, I forgot in my comments because I got a little carried away with my emotions. Um, I really wanted to thank Mr. O'Neill for all his work on uh, getting us chosen for the Council of Great City Schools and also just because he's been a member of that council for so many years and always bringing back information. So I just wanted to really say thank you. I'm really excited um, also because we don't have to travel, so that would be really great. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you as well. Uh, 
And thank you, Mr. Chair. If there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to approve the superintendent's report as submitted. Is there a second? Any discussion or objection to the motion? Any objection to approving the superintendent's report by unanimous consent? Well, hearing none, uh, we will, uh, the, excuse me, the superintendent's report is uh, approved. And before we move on to general public comment, we have our monthly report from our student representative, Ms. Evelyn Reyes, uh, who will tell us a little bit about what BSAC's been up to. Ms. Reyes. Yes, um, good evening all. Um, I'd like to start tonight by sharing that before this meeting, I had a chance to meet with the superintendent's student executive um, council, excuse me, and it was wonderful. We had a chance to sit down with members from the executive team and talk to them about what it's like um, on a day-to-day -day basis for them here at Central Office. It was great to s take a deep dive into their work and really understand what they do. And I look forward to continuing to work with the council and the executive team as the year goes on. On a more serious note, over the last couple of weeks, BSAC has taken time to share concern and really discuss the amount of access and sharing of student information that's been happening between the district and ICE. Um, we know that Dr. Casilius and BPS have been taking measures to address that concern and we're glad to hear that that's happening. Um, we also had a chance this past Monday to meet with Carol Leon from the Mayor's Office of for Immigrant Advancement and two representatives from the Irish International Immigrant Center. They gave us a training on rights um, and what to do when faced with ICE agents. And we also talked about how we can continue to work with the district to offer support to families and students who need it. Um, over the last couple of weeks, BSAC has also um, provided feedback on community partnership applications, and we've had a chance to review those and give our opinions on what partnerships we think are valuable and really dive into how the partnerships with the district and the community work. And upcoming, we have students meeting with headmasters, and that'll be happening before the end of February and they will discuss BSAC priorities with their headmasters, gather input from headmasters and feedback as well. We'll talk th in those meetings, we'll be talking about the dress code policy that we have been drafting this year, um, how M7 replacements are handled in schools. So for example, some schools offer free M7 replacements while others come at a cost. Um, we'll also be talking about the lack of gender neutral bathrooms in schools for students and whether schools are recycling and powering down on Fridays. And we'll also address heat stress in schools. Um, I'd also like to take this chance to share a very exciting opportunity that we have coming up for BSAC students. We'll be traveling, a group of us will be traveling to Washington DC with the organization Close Up. Um, it's a chance for us to really understand how democracy works in this country and meet with leaders from Congress and discuss um, what it's like in Boston for us to interact with local government and also to understand how national government works. Um, for that, we've been doing a lot of fundraising and as you pass through the lobby, you might see us. We have a table down there. We'd love your support if you can offer it. Um, and I'd also like to take this chance to recognize one of the members of our team, Abraham Rosorio. Mm -hmm. This is his last week with us. And he has mm -hmm. been an amazing mentor to each and every student that has walked through our doors. Um, he's a BSAC coordinator, and I know that he's touched every single one of us mm -hmm. in a very special way, and we'll miss him greatly. Mm -hmm. So yes, I wanted to appreciate him. And that's all, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Ms. Reyes, and uh, I can tell you that the oatmeal cookies were uh, delicious downstairs, so I highly recommend <laughs> you uh, get a chance to get down there. Uh, open it up to members for questions or discussion with Ms. Reyes. Ms. Uh, Robinson? Yes. How many students are planning to go on the trip? Um, right now we have 10. There are still students who are coming off and on, mm -hmm. but as of right now, 10. Do you have a GoFundMe site, or how else do you are you collecting donations at this point? Um, we have fundraising, we have a link on Facebook, on the BSAC Facebook, and then 
we have, of course, the table downstairs. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Ms. Oliver, uh, Vice Chair Oliver Galloway. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, you guys are doing a lot of things. That's very exciting. Um, I, you know, I'm very supportive of all the work you all do, especially the climate change. I think that's really important. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the ice piece, um, if you can talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of um, how BSAC can help to make sure that our families um, feel safe. And so I'm wondering about um, the training um, that's being passed along and like the language capacity for uh, families um, that speak other languages. So if you can just talk about that, I'd be really interested to see what you guys are doing. Absolutely. Um, I know that we started with asking questions because there are a lot of questions to ask and there's a lot of things to understand about who has information about who and what that information is and why they have access to it and all of that. Um, we spent, I think, about an hour just sort of coming up with a list of questions and we sent that to the mayor's office um, and we're waiting for a response to come back. Mm -hmm. The meeting on Monday with the representatives from the mayor's office gave us a chance to understand what's appropriate in encounters with ICE and what's the difference between meeting or coming in contact with ICE agents versus the police, for example, and sort of how those organizations mm -hmm. work differently within our communities. And we also have been wondering how we can take what we're learning and share it with our own communities. It's something that we took a chance to talk about as well, and we're currently in the process of figuring that out. Um, I think one of the things that we want to do is figure out a way to adapt that training and make it a little shorter and just like quicker to get through so that we can take it to schools and we can deliver it ourselves and just pass along the information that way. Um, especially because it's critical for students to be able to understand what's happening. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, and if I, we can talk offline, but I'd, I'd love to be able to talk more because we do have some resources. Um, but I just wanted <coughs> to make sure if we can make sure to talk with other families and figure <coughs> out the language piece. And I do look forward to a school committee, as we talked about at the last meeting, to look at some policy around this. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salmer. <laughs> Any other further questions for uh, Ms. Reyes? Okay. Well, thank you again for your report. We'll look forward to uh, the next one in uh, February. All right, uh, moving on now to uh, general public comment, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Lacanto. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school <coughs> committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may, may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. Each speaker will have three minutes to speak, and I will remind you when you have one minute remaining and then 30 seconds. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Any signage must not prohibit the, prohibit the participation of others. Please state your name and affiliation before you begin. TV cameras will only record speakers who face the committee. We have 12 speakers this evening, and we'll begin with Nora Vincent, followed by Alana Haynes and Jessica <coughs> Tang. Is Ms. Vincent with us? Yes. So I was surprised um, that you guys each have like elected officials. I just I think it'd be helpful to introduce. Them. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. It, if the other two speakers are fine with that, that's fine by me. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for understanding. Um. Uh, 
So good evening, uh, Chair Lacanto, members of the school committee, superintendent. So I am here, um, my name is Jessica Tang, president of the Boston Teachers Union. I'm here representing 10,000 members of the BTU and the BTU Inclusion Committee. Our members and fellow stakeholders are here tonight to share concerns, hopes, and ideas regarding special education inclusion in the district. As we committed in the May 2019 Memorandum of Agreement, the City of Boston, Boston Public Schools, and the Boston Teachers Union are, quote, committed to working collaboratively with each other and community stakeholders to create a shared vision for inclusion, end quote. We are here in that spirit of collaboration and partnership and our shared commitment to get inclusion done right. The BTU embraces the vision of inclusion where all students will have access to an educational program that will effectively meet their needs and where educators will go to work day in and day out, feeling supported by skillful colleagues who can work with them to make it possible to effectively do their jobs and adequately meet the needs of their students. While BTU educators, school leaders, and staff are working diligently to enact this vision, there are still many instances throughout the district where the implementation of inclusive programs are still both inadequate and incomplete. Over the last six months, our union has been working with Superintendent Caselius and the Special Education Department in, in an inclusion work group that was established by our last contract settlement. As the MOU states, quote, the working group shall convene as frequently as possible to make initial recommendations for the 2019-2020 school year and make recommendations for immediate and long-term solutions that will support evidence-based practices for inclusion programming, end quote. We know it is a shared priority. Superintendent Caselius has been responsive and we are appreciative of the opportunities to exchange recommendations and have productive conversations. After speaking again yesterday, we are also hopeful about the most current proposal shared at the Working Group Monday as a starting place for meaningful improvements and look forward to meeting again tomorrow. However, while hopeful, we have yet to reach agreement and initial recommendations have not yet been implemented, so the urgency to get inclusion done right remains. It has been our objective to gather stories from different schools in order to understand both what is going well and what problems still exist. These are a few of the stories we are bringing to you tonight. There are a few exemplary inclusion programs in Boston, but the number of children and families who are able to access them is very limited. In almost all of the most successful classrooms, there are two teachers assigned to an inclusion classroom, one regular and one special educator. While that is not the only model that can be successful, what we know with certainty is that one double or triple certified teacher alone is not adequate to meet the educational needs in an inclusion classroom. And in many cases, the mandated service is spelled out and the student's IEPs can also cannot be met with only one teacher supported by one paraprofessional. So we're here tonight to share their stories with the school committee so that everyone can better understand the challenges more deeply. We'll continue to come before you with the stories over the winter and spring until we agree on recommendations to strengthen the inclusion programs in Boston so that all children across race, class, culture, and ability have access to excellent and equitable programs and so that all educators can do their jobs well for all of their students. So we're asking for your support for our students and for the educators and for the collaborative work we are engaged in with the superintendent. And we're asking you to join us in getting inclusion <coughs> done right in BPS. Thank you. Thank you, President Tang, and um, thank you, Ms. Vincent, Ms. Haynes, for bearing with us. Um, I wanted to mention for, uh, since we have a, f a few more people in the audience than normal this evening, and uh, we have a new uh, doohickey on the uh, table here um, that uh, we uh, implemented a few months ago. Uh, this is um, a, a red, yellow, and green light. Um, the yellow light goes off when you have 30 seconds remaining, and the red light goes off when uh, the three minutes are up. So we just wanted to try to um, <coughs> get something out here that would help everybody recognize um, when uh, your time is expiring, and um, we hope it's not too much of a distraction. So thank you. Very, very multisensory. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> uh, are we starting? Yep. Sorry. Please, go ahead. Um, thank you to, to the chair, Dr. Casilius, and members of the school committee. Sorry. We are Elena Haynes and Nora Vincent, co-chairs of the Phineas Bates Family Council. We're speaking today with concern over how inclusion is funded, both in the district and at our school, as well as on our projected budget for the next school year. Due to enrollment shifts, a pattern over which we have no control, we are projected to lose students in funding for the next school year, approximately 
$135,000 from what would be level shift st level staffing from this year. This means some combination of the, our arts, science, physical education, or excellence for all programming is likely to be cut. The change to a single wait list for prospective BPS families has harmed our school's enrollment. K-2 seats that are typically filled by October remain empty into December. In addition, the BPS Welcome Center gave conflicting information to prospective and current Bates families about availability in both K-2 and our K-0-K-1 classrooms. Current Bates families who knew of available seats spent months calling the Welcome Center to secure a seat for younger siblings. The Welcome Center gave them conflicting information over that time, requiring an inordinate amount of ac advocacy on the part of these families. Other families new to the Boston Public Schools may not understand or expect the need for this extraordinary effort. It should not fall on families to do the work of the Welcome Center, nor should any school's budget suffer from the bureaucratic issue. The uncertainty of a sixth grade in the phasing of the middle school and another factor contributing to our loss of enrollment. As rumors spread about the closure of middle schools, families have left the Bates when they are presented with sibling priority at a K through eight school. A clear plan for where students can expect to go after fifth grade will help stem upper grade enrollment losses. And then we're gonna mess with your timer because I'm gonna pick up my time here. Um, we believe that the current weighted student funding system creates a cycle of winners and losers across the district. Funding for important staff positions fluctuates year to year based on enrollment shifts caused by large systemic factors beyond the control of individual schools. This near constant state of flux in staffing and programming creates instability for students and school communities, as well as for our teachers. We submit to you that in a district that has struggled to recruit and retain educators of color, we have to ask ourselves which teachers this staff and program churn is affecting the most. As an inclusion school, the Bates serves children who receive a range of special education services and general education students in every classroom. Our school leader creates a budget with input from staff and families to support the model we have in place. Right now, there are two classrooms on each grade level, each with their own homeroom teacher. At each grade level, we also have a master special education teacher serving as an inclusion specialist as well as a paraprofessional. So there are always two adults in every classroom. This ensures the classroom teachers are supported by special education teachers for half the school day and have the support of a paraprofessional for the other half of the day. We're also able to have a crisis team in place with a full-time board certified behavior analyst, BCBA, and a social worker. Beyond these basic school-wide needs, we believe all students deserve physical education, arts education, and science and technology education. We know that these are often thought of as quote unquote extras or enrichment, and we know how common it is for children with special needs to be offered remediation while children labeled as gifted are offered enrichment. We worry that these important enriching opportunities will increasingly be sacrificed due to our commitment to staffing the inclusion model the right way. We know that the free, appropriate public education that our students with special needs are entitled to is one that is staffed appropriately for them to be both enriched and supported in accessing the curriculum. With these concerns in mind, we ask that you reconsider our school's total budget to reflect the resources all of Boston students need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sonia Medina, and she'll be followed by Peggy McLaughlin and Shante Alves. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Sonia Medina. Good evening. My name is Sonia Medina. Soy madre de cuatro niños. I am a mother of four children. El más pequeño tiene cinco años. The little one is only five years old. Y se supone que está en clase regular. And he's supposed to be a part of a regular class. Estoy aquí porque mi hijo tí está en asiste a K2. The reason why I'm here is because my kid, he goes to a K2. Clase de inclusión. And he's part of an inclusion class at the moment. Inmediatamente me entero de esto, busco explicación. Once I became aware that he was part of an inclusion class, I try to, I try to find some explanation from school. Que le, para que la escuela me explique la respuesta es porque es que mi hijo es, sorry, 
So I'm sorry. So I was trying to look for an explanation, and according to that, is that my son? Yes. Es que me es que mi hijo al ser independiente puede funcionar como ejemplo. According to them, my son being independent, he should be able to function and uh, be an example for other students. Al seguir para al seguir para necesidades especiales. An example to follow uh, from up to other students, from other students, for like for example, special needs students. Mi hijo está avanzado perfectamente. My opinion, he is uh, progressing very well, perfectly well. Y me enegullece también, quiero agregar que las clases de inclusión especial es, una, es un currículo preparado. I am very proud of this and I would like to add also that the special inclusion class requires a specialized curriculum, the inclusion class. De atención a especialidades, los niños con, con maestro de inclusión it has to include an inclusion teacher and uh, accordingly prepared teachers as well. Deben tra trabajar agregando informaciones computarizadas según el niño en avance académico. So depending on their academic skills, they do have to update the information in a computerized way. It is their role. Estas son algunas diferencias entre maestro de inclusión y maestro general. These are some of the main difference between a general teacher and an inclusion teacher. Pero me pregunto, ¿por qué no hay maestro de categoría inclusión? So I ask myself the question, why there is no inclusion teacher? Juntos a nuestros niños en de clases generales en el aula. That they can work together with a general teacher in their classroom. I ask myself that question. También me preocupa dónde va a estar el avance de nuestros niños. It is also concerning to me how are they going to progress. Al no tener suf el sufi suficiente maestro de categoría de inclusión. If there are not sufficient uh, inclusion teachers in the class. Junto a maestro general. Working along with the general teacher. Como madre mento dentro de la escuela creo que es que los paraprofesionales ya tienen suficiente trabajo. As a mentor mother that I am, I do believe that the paraprofesionals have an extensive overload of work at the moment already. Estoy segura que todos los niños pueden tener mejor avances. I am very convinced that they can <coughs> progress even more, every kid. Si se trabaja en conjunto con, con estos tres personas, que If all three professionals work in unison all together que son los maestros de inclusión, maestro general y para profesional. Being the part professional, the general teacher, and the inclusion teacher working all three together. Es lo que pienso como madre de la escuela. That is what I think as a mother from a kid that goes to school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After Ms. McLaughlin, we'll hear from Shante Elves and Amanda Haldas. Good evening. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, my name is Peggy McLaughlin. I am here today as both a teacher and a parent. Um, I was one of the first inclusion teachers in Boston. I taught inclusion kindergarten in 1991, and I am currently the inclusion specialist at the Condon School. My daughter, Ava, who has Down syndrome, attends the Henderson Inclusion School in Dorchester. And when inclusion is done right, it is a positive experience for everyone involved. Unfortunately, there is a lack of equity in the inclusive practices of Boston Public Schools. Not all students have access to the right inclusive setting, and therefore we are not seeing students, or we're not setting them up for success. What is the right inclusive setting? Well, we have models in our school system which are using best practices, meaning there's more than one teacher responsible. We need to replicate these practices for all inclusion classes. Our students and teachers need the proper staffing to address IEP goals. One teacher cannot spend 45 minutes giving direct reading instruction to two students while the other 18 work independently. We need... <laughs> we need two teachers to share this responsibility, and we need to have coverage for our paraprofessionals when they are absent. We need safe, appropriate spaces for our students to learn, including spaces for students to calm down and sensory rooms. Our educators need professional development, 
which is specifically geared towards ways to support our students. We need um, our paraprofessionals to be included in these trainings and time to plan together. <laughs> Some of our schools have access to specially designed research-based curriculums such as Touch Math, Orton-Gillingham, Leveled Literacy. These curriculums need to be available to all students. Some schools have access to technology such as writing programs, book shares, touch screen computers, smart boards, and educational apps. Others are sharing broken Chromebooks. <laughs> I am asking for the school committee to do what is right for our students so that we can all set up, be set up for success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shante Alves, followed by Amanda Holtus and Zoe Fahey. Good evening. Good evening, members of the school committee. My name is Shante Alves, and I'm a six-year BPS early childhood educator. I'm here today to advocate for adequate training and support for instruction stakeholders and consistent support and funding for our students. Last year, before the principal decided to leave my school and district, the special education model was drastically changed and several learning specialists were accessed. What we, the teachers, and the incoming principal were left with was an incomplete plan and understaffed model on how to teach and reach all students. Inclusion teachers were given added responsibilities such as writing IEPs, progress reports, and annual review reports without any formal training. However, even if I had the training, these added responsibilities take away from the time we need to plan and prep to do our primary job, which is to meet the needs of all our students. Although five of my six years of teaching have been in an inclusion classroom, although five of my six years of training have been in an inclusion classroom, pulling aside the learning specialist that is now assigned to multiple grades and learning how to do reports on the fly is not the way I want to learn how to do my new responsibilities. What is most troubling is that in the upper grades, where paraprofessional support is less consistent, teachers have taken a day off just to be able to complete reports for caseloads case ranging from eight to 12 students, depending on the grade. When there is no paraprofessional or special educator supporting each inclusion classroom, students' needs are not met. Dual or triple licensure does not make up for quality small group instruction. At minimum, the supports given in early childhood years should continue along each student's educational journey. Our children deserve consistent support and resources in their schools. As our students adjust to several life changes and even traumatic situations throughout their educational journey, they need more support and opportunities to help them succeed, not less. Thank you, Ms. Elves. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Hi, my name is Amanda Holthouse. Um, I'm here as a mom. Uh, we recently moved to Dorchester, and my son, Nikki, is a K-2 student in the Boston Public Schools. He started this year in an inclusion classroom at the Mason School in Roxbury, right around the corner from where we live. He's bright, playful, and lovable, and um, he has Down syndrome. After Nikki spent the fall uh, trying to climb up a window, escaping the classroom, going in one door and out the back, um, my son had a wonderful teacher who did everything she could to keep him safe and to try and meet his educational needs per his IEP. However, as one teacher and one paraprofessional in the room, there was a limit to what could be done. I was told that the school really valued my child and would like to keep him. However, the chances of increasing the staffing, even though he came from another school where he had a one-to-one -one on his IEP, uh, was next to nothing. Um, I was advised to seek another placement for Nikki. My son made very little progress during the period that he was at the Mason, and given the energy that it took to keep him in the classroom, I can only wonder how much progress the other kids made. <coughs> 
Nikki is now assigned to an ABA classroom at the Warren Prescott in Charlestown. There are a total of six kids in that classroom. He is doing much better in this small setting with a lot of adults. However, Nikki is missing out on the peer models that he would have in an inclusion community. And um, if you know children with Down syndrome, they have a great capacity to learn from their typically developing peers. In my network of families for children who have Down syndrome, I know other mothers who chil whose children are being successfully included at the Henderson. I asked about the Henderson, but um, we were assigned to Warren Prescott. I can't understand why this opportunity is not available to my child. Nikki should be able to be educated in an inclusive, inclusive classroom. That can't happen for a child like mine without more staffing and more resources to meet the needs of all children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zoe Fahey, and she'll be followed by Paul Friedman and John Mudd. Hello. Good evening. Is it this one? Okay. Either one works. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Zoe Fay. I am a third grade inclusion teacher at the McKay K-8 in East Boston. Um, it is my second year as a teacher, so I'm a new educator, and uh, I feel very fortunate to work at a school where I have a position in a co-taught classroom, so I want to share some ways that I've benefited as a teacher, and I feel that my students have benefited from that environment. Um, as you've heard, I just know so, so many inclusion teachers who serve and service students through multiple licenses and feel stretched thin and are just working so far over time. And quite simply, co-teaching just allows us to be fully present and available to respond to the creative challenge of building an inclusive classroom that actually serves all students. Um, we have a cohort this year that's working on standards and curriculum that ranges from kindergarten through fourth grade. Um, and co-teaching means that one of us, for example, could be working one-on-one, -on -one, trying out different visual kinesthetic sight word practices with a student who's an emergent reader, while another one of us supervises an extension sort of book club and then is also previewing that content and those routines so that students with disabilities can then successfully access that book club in an upcoming unit. So it's complex work and it just means everything that two of us can be putting our brains together and constantly working for that to happen. Um, the when I think about it, really, it's just, it's twice the number of eyes on student work. It's twice the number of caring adults who are forming relationships with students, and it's really incredible to have that opportunity. Um, while I feel very fortunate to have this model at my school, obviously there is more work to be done. The trade-off is that, uh, similar to a former testimony, we are often getting pulled to test other students to perform Wyatt's with no training. Uh, because we do not, the trade-off was that we don't really have support staff and that all services are expected to be provided within our classroom, whether or not we have that training. Um, specialist teachers are also continuing to teach alone with inclusion classes, which is an extremely difficult job. Um, we, have a st we have a STEM teacher who is expected to teach inclusion by herself in an academic subject, um, and not only is she not set up for success, but students who need a one-on-one -on -one scribe or who need small group scaffolded support are missing out on the science education that they deserve because she couldn't possibly provide those supports. 30 seconds. Um, so I really thank you for your time and for all of your continued work to support our students. Thank you. speaker is Paul Friedman and he'll be followed by John Mudd and Rachel Young. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. My name is Paul Friedman. I'm a parent of two children at the Charles Sumner School in Rosendale and a member of the Sumner School, School Site Council. I'm here tonight to explain to you some of the challenges facing the Sumner in the upcoming fiscal year and to ask for your support in mitigating some of the $190,000 in cuts our community is facing. The district has argued that the ideal model for a Boston elementary school is one that can maintain not just multiple strands of regular education classrooms, but also strands for students with special learning and language needs. Uh, regular, uh, sorry, that's it. Um, while many Boston schools are too small to fit this bill, the Sumner has them all, regular education, inclusion, learning disabled, and shelter English instruction strands. 
Our building that originally housed about 300 students in the 1930s now holds over 500. Despite the fact that almost every possible space is used for classrooms, our enrollment numbers are declining. The reasons we speculate are diverse, including the lack of a sixth grade and the impending closure of the Irving Middle School, student assignment changes, demographic changes, and uneven academic performance. In any case, our classrooms are not completely full. We even had or have open spots in usually highly demanded programs like K-1 and K-2 and SCI. As a result, we have less incoming revenue, but not enough fewer students to close classrooms or strands. While we do appreciate the increase in per pupil funding in this new budget, the increases have not kept pace with the salary increases deservedly allocated to our teachers and paraprofessionals. Our new dynamic principal, Megan Welch, is doing her best to lead the Sumner back to academic success. But in her first two years on the job, she has faced hundreds of thousands of dollars in cuts. It's almost about four, over $400,000 in cuts. She has been creative to make sure that the students have the classroom teachers they need, but the cuts have required her to trim everything else to the bone. As you can imagine, this is going to make it increasingly difficult for her to be flexible as she needs to be to make sure that all students at the Sumner are learning. In the short term, we see three crucial financial decisions that could be made to help us balance our budget without resorting to cuts of some of what is making the Sumner, Sumner's budget so threadbare. First, fund one-to-one -one Chromebooks down to the third through fifth grade spans at all schools so that all students and teachers have the technology they need to access teaching, learning, and assessment resources. Second, fund STEM positions at all, not just some schools, in the coming fiscal year. All of our students need access to STEM teachers, and all schools need financial support to hire and or maintain these positions. Both of these choices would free up budget to restore a number of key positions and members to our community. Third, in order to support teaching and learning for some of our most academically at-risk students, our English language learners, we have had to reduce funding for family engagement. 30 seconds. Thanks. Um, this is an example of robbing Peter to pay Paul as family outreach support is most crucial for our non-English speaking families. If this funding was restored, we would have an even greater chance of making sure all students at the Sumner would get the education they deserve. In the long term, we ask again that the district fast track our effort to add a sixth grade to the Sumner. We believe that this would help us attract and retain more students and with them the funding that would allow such a diverse and important school to truly thrive. Mr. Mudd. <clears throat> John Mudd, advocate. Uh, as the staff member who, uh, I think it was in 1992, helped negotiate the end of Massachusetts Advocates for Children lawsuit against Boston on the treatment of special education students and promote inclusion, that, that agreement included a major commitment to training for teachers, developing inclusion programs. And this makes me very, how should I put it, sad, to put it mildly, to hear where we have or have not come on inclusion in Boston. I, I, I came here actually tonight to talk about, highlight three other issues, and I'll try and do it very quickly. First, as a member of the uh, ELL task force and a longtime advocate, I want to strongly uh, support the recommendation that as we look for a new assistant superintendent for English language learners, we ca conduct a national search and use a screening committee with experts, uh, stakeholders, and other appropriate BPS officials, as has been done by uh, other superintendents in the past. This is a crucial position. We need to know we have the best for our children. Secondly, I wrote, uh, <coughs> I wrote this before <laughs> you mentioned the uh, coordinated program review from DESE, uh, but the, the brunt of my little paragraph here is still true. I very am very concerned that the results of the coordinated program review be public s before we finally approve the superintendent's strategic action plan. We need to benefit from the insights of DESE in order to ensure that we use their valuable recommendations or consider the problems they've identified. I would hope that you would not wait for just the response and the ultimate, it says in that article, the ultimate release of the report at some indefined time, but when you receive it, you would pu make public the report and your response. Uh, so that we can all benefit from that. Finally, I want to point out that in the new Student Opportunity Act, there is a requirement 
that there be a three-year achievement gap plan submitted by BPS uh, on April 1. And I, I am very concerned about uh, that we know and that that plan be developed in collaboration with stakeholders, other parent groups like the uh, SPEDPAC or DLAC or uh, English Language Learners Task Force or the Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force. And we need to focus on that and understand what role Colin Rose and the Opportunity and Achievement Gap Task Force will be playing as we develop and submit that plan by April. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Rachel Young, followed by Lisa Brown. Good evening. Um, I wanted to start by saying that I'm, I'm heartened to listen to all of the eloquent speakers that we've had this evening, um, speaking about what's important to them, what's important to us as a community, and I wanted to say that I, I'm proud to be part of this community and speaking before you this evening. Um, my name is Rachel Young, I'm a resident of Rosendale, and my kindergartner goes to the Sumner. Um, I'm here tonight to echo some of the comments that my fellow parent Paul Friedman has made, as well as the um, parents at the Bates. Um, we're facing severe budget cuts, and we hope you can hel help us overcome them. Specifically, we need to fully fund our Chromebook needs and our STEM teaching staff. In addition, we need support to bring a sixth grade to our school. A sixth grade would make us competitive and stem a current trend in under enrollment. Um, my daughter's only in kindergarten, but already her class has shrunk by 10%. Um, these are seats that in all likelihood will never be filled. Um, and I recently had the displeasure to have to break the news to her that her best friend that she's known since she was a baby was leaving her classroom because they were offered a space in a school with a sixth grade. I, I can't describe the, the pain I felt watching her cry that morning. Under enrollment hurts my family, it hurts her classroom, it hurts our community. Um, and while we've had increased per pupil spending, it hasn't kept pace with the salary increases that we've also experienced. It means we have tight budgets, and as a result, we stand to lose our community. For example, our amazing family engagement coordinator who just brings joy to our school. Um, I can't say enough about her, but I will say that I'm not looking forward to sharing more bad news with my daughter if she ends up leaving the school as well. Um, again, I ask you to reconsider the budget that we've been met with and help us, um, help us have the school that all our students in all our city deserve. Good evening, Dr. Caselius, school evening. committee members, <coughs> and BPS community. My name is Lisa Brown, and I'm the project director of the Racial Equity and Access Project, known as REAP, at Massachusetts Advocates for Children. REAP focuses primarily on Boston students and desires to work collaboratively <coughs> excuse me, to dismantle the school-to-prison pipeline and advance racial equity in Boston. One of REAP's current priorities is addressing and working to stop the exclusion and gradual push-out of black and Lat Latinx students with disabilities. As an organization that has advocated for the inclusion of students in, in BPS and throughout Massachusetts for over 50 years, we are encouraged to see educators, parents, and community members come together around a goal of taking a deep look at the state of special education, including looking at inclusion. MAC looks forward to exploring how we can collaborate with the Inclusion Done Right campaign, the district, and others committed to improving access to and the quality of education for Boston students, particularly students of color and students with disabilities. We ask that the school committee lend its support to this effort by seriously engaging with community efforts to assess and improve special education services. In particular, we ask that you join us in addressing the racial inequities in special education in the district, join us in working to meet the needs of English learners with disabilities mm -hmm. in our city, and, wor and join us in working to address the ways in which black and Latinx students in special education are gradually excluded from education. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. Lacondo, that concludes our speakers for general public comment. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Sullivan. Thank you to everyone who came out and spoke this evening um, to our uh, bargaining partners at the BTU. We look forward to continuing to negotiate with you on uh, this, in, uh, this inclusion um, package uh, that will follow uh, the collective bargaining agreement that we finished last year. And to parents that have come out and talked uh, about the uh, budget tonight, um, we hear you. Um, we're moving through the budget process. Uh, by next year, by next week, we will have a budget delivered to this body. That'll be our first opportunity to see the finished product of uh, what the district has been working on with uh, the new uh, infusion of cash from uh, the uh, from City Hall, from uh, the mayor's budget, um, and with uh, an identified set of uh, priorities that uh, this district will be uh, investing in. So we look forward to that, and we'll look forward to digging into uh, uh, the effects of. Uh, that, uh, that budget on each and every one of our schools. So we'll move on now. Uh, there is no consent calendar, uh, excuse me, consent calendar tonight. Um, so we're gonna move on straight into our first uh, report, which is the Massachusetts School Building Authority Accelerated Repair Program, Statements of Interest. At this time, I'd like to invite Brian McLaughlin, the Chief of Staff for the City's Public Facilities Department, to please step forward with his presentation. Mr. McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Superintendent, members of the board, members of the school committee, excuse me. Uh, the Massachusetts School Building Authority is a state authority that oversees funding for school construction projects throughout the Commonwealth. The MSBA is funded through one penny in the Massachusetts sales tax. The first step in the MSBA process is to submit a statement of interest. This is what the MSBA refers to as their application. Um, submitting a statement of interest allows a district to notify the MSBA that there's, a, there's something going on in a building that negatively impacts their ability to deliver their desired educational program. The SOI requires votes of both the school committee and the city council, and when submitting a statement of interest, you need to, sum, you need to select one of the two MSBA programs. The core program, which is for school construction projects that are new construction, addition renovation, large repairs, and the accelerated repair program, which is for uh, replacement or repair to roofs, windows, and boilers in a particular school. The, again, the accelerated repair program is limited to just roof, window, and boiler replacements in otherwise structurally sound facilities. The MSBA was created in 2004. It replaced the School Building Assistance Program. From 2004 to 2014, the city received $5.9 million in reimbursement on a total of five projects. <coughs> Since the time Mayor Walsh took office, he has made it a priority to leverage state funds on school projects and with the help of the school committee. Um, city of Boston has significantly increased collaborative efforts with the MSBA. And since 2015, the city has completed 18 projects with an additional nine approved. Six of these nine will go into construction in the summer of 2020. Three are currently in design and slated for summer of 2021 construction. The 18 completed projects in the six that are going into construction this summer represent $65 million in total project costs with a potential reimbursement of $38.6 million. In addition, the city is collaborating with the MSBA on several core program projects that resulted in an additional $86 million in reimbursement since 2015. That includes the Dearborn STEM Academy and the Boston Arts Academy. The Josiah Quincy uh, Upper School is currently in design and slated to start construction the summer of 2021. And excitingly, we just got approval from the MSBA to enter into a contract with an architect for the Carter School. Uh, Perkins and Will is the architectural firm. We hope to, we're uh, in fee negotiations with them right now, and hopefully we'll start design on that project by the end of this month. 
Uh, within the accelerator repair program submission, you have to work within the requirements of the program. Roofs and boilers must be at least 25 years old. Windows must be 30 years old. The cost of the uh, potential project must be over $250,000. The building that we submit the statement of interest for must be used for educational purposes. It cannot be an administrative building. Uh, the scope of work, again, limited to those building systems that need replacement, and there cannot be overcrowding. Similar to years past, uh, the two 2020 statements of interest submissions were chosen after review of several criteria, including the overall condition of the facility, selecting facilities that meet the accelerator repair program requirements, and projects that provide an opportunity for the city to maximize our reimbursement on these on the eligible cost of these projects. Uh, the Public Facilities Department worked closely with the BPS facilities team, making sure that the projects that are going to move forward for submission are school, uh, our systems within school buildings that have reached the end of the their useful life and are continually needing repair. Uh, you will also see the opportunity index on this in this slide. Um, as part of our review, we wanted to make sure the updates to these building systems are creating better learning environments for the students across the district. Based on the review of the schools throughout BPS, uh, we are requesting the following 11 schools be fo put forth for the 2020 Accelerator Repair Program with the MSBA. The, there will be six window submissions uh, for the Samuel Adams Elementary School, Boston Day and Eden Academy, the Curtis Guild Elementary School, the Nathan Hale Elementary School, the Raphael Hernandez K-8 School, and Higginson Lewis K-8. We'd be submitting for a roof replacement at the Henderson Upper, Orenberger K-8, the Otis Elementary School, and the Winship Elementary School, as well as a boiler replacement project at the Patrick Kennedy Elementary School. In order to submit the SOI, they must be accompanied by the vote of the City Council and the School Committee. Today, the, the matter appeared on the City Council docket with a hearing to be scheduled hopefully within the next week so we can have a vote by the City Council on February 5th or February 12th before the application deadline of February 14th. Next week's School Committee meeting, a uh, vote has been drafted in hopes that you will take a vote to support these 11 submissions <coughs> um, prior to the February 14th deadline. After the February 4th de 14th deadline, in years past, the MSBA usually takes several months to review these applications. And we will likely hear in the summer of 2020 whether or not uh, they have been moved forward for pot uh, potential reimbursement and collabor collaboration with the MSBA. Uh, in the appendix of the, uh, of the presentation, you'll see some of the uh, information on some of the school, particular schools that we've uh, completed projects on in the past, and I'd gladly answer any questions at this time. Well, thanks so much, Mr. McLaughlin, and uh, you've been a frequent flyer here uh, the last couple of years. We know you've been hard at work uh, and seeing us on almost, a, I, I think, an annual basis talking about these um, roof and uh, boiler and, and window replacements. So appreciate you uh, giving us a quick uh, refresher on the process and uh, for taking action on these uh, or proposing action on these 11 schools. Uh, we'll open it up to uh, members for questions or discussion. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. And just a couple of quick questions. How many, um, when you give the criteria on page four, how many schools do you feel in the district would actually meet this criteria? So how many did you consider to arrive at uh, the recommended 11? Um, I I'd probably say somewhere right now we, we've, we've addressed, I guess, uh, 27 to date with the 11 submissions. Um, there's probably another, I mean, I'd say 20 to 25 that we could really look at for next year. Um, that being said, uh, if the MSBA doesn't move forward with some of these applications, we'd, we'd likely move them to the capital program independent of MSBA. Last year we submitted six, three they felt didn't meet we felt met the criteria, but they, for whatever reason, uh, well, last year they didn't approve any window projects. So English High School, um, Dudley Street, Josiah Quinn's Elementary School have been moved to the capital 
uh, pipeline in hopes that we can move those projects forward independent of MSBA. But there's still a number of schools I think we could address within the accelerated pair program in the coming years. Okay. And um, secondly, I'm delighted, by the way, to see the Higgins and Lewis on here for windows because those windows are <laughs> just, I, f I feel so, you know, the yeah. uh, a building that actually has beautiful views and you can't see anything out of it, right? It's amazing what natural light will, will do for the classroom and for the exactly. students who are in there. So, the, and so I'm delighted to see that. But I'm struck by, you know, we've talked with the West Roxbury building, with the Jackson Mann building, those buildings that were built in the 70s that just – in terrible shape, yeah. right? And I, I know most of our buildings, but you know, would we have been better served if we had replaced the Jackson Man Building roof, as an example, several years ago, put them in, put it in for it, and the same thing in West Roxbury. Those seem to be the leading. I the roof seems to be the leading indicators for those buildings. Have we had many more like it? Blackstone, Harvard Kent. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the others that have that same design time frame that have a lot of challenges. Yeah, in, in West Roxbury High School was submitted several years back, and the MSBA did not move forward with it because of the additional work they felt were, were needed at the facility. Yeah. Um, Do you think that's the same issue with Jackson Man at, at this point, the roof? I think the, there's it's created too other work on that's the exterior needed. of the building, et cetera. Yeah. So MSBA reviews the the hard copy application, <coughs> and then they go out and visit the facilities. And if they feel there's additional work needed beyond a roof window or boiler replacement, they will not move that project forward for further consideration. That's what happened with the West Roxbury uh, Education <coughs> Complex. My question is, though, those, those to me were early warning indicators, I think, in those buildings that then led to problems with the exterior yeah. and, and, and systems internally because of all the leaking. Right. I mean, the superintendent of I have been in the Jackson Man and saw, you know, the extent of the damage from the leaking. I'm wondering in some of these other buildings that are of the same time frame, Blackstone, Harvard Kent, you name it, are we missing an opportunity to do the roofs now before they create more problems? I'd have to look at the individual schools because some of these schools' uh, roofs have already been addressed mm -hmm. um, in recent years, so they don't hit that 25-year uh, minimum age requirement for submissions. Mm -hmm. uh, Josiah Quincy Elementary School, uh, we submitted that, but we pulled it back because uh, they also had some masonry issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, uh, we have a capital program, pa capital project independent of MSBA that's going to address masonry, windows, and roof all in one project. Um, I think that one of the best things about ARP is what you just mentioned, is to put money to protect the, the asset by updating the uh, the roof or the windows to prevent further uh, further issues with whatever it may be leaking from the roof or water infiltration from the windows. And and one other quick question: I know the um, Madison Park and O'Brien have had leaking issues as well. Were those considered for the project? We're doing a w we're actually out at Madison Park right now replacing one section of the roof. Over the stairwell where it leaks so poorly, or building four, I'm not sure I'm not the sure exact. Remember, yeah. uh, if that's the stairwell that that you referenced, um, I know ob o all the schools are looked at uh, when reviewing for potential ARP candidacy, okay. and uh, we we move forward the ones that we feel are most appropriate. Well, thank you for your work on this. You have um, your leadership on this, and other folks who work on it have led to a lot of state money coming into our buildings that we had not been asking for for years, so thank you for that. <coughs> Amos O'Neill, Dr. Rivera. Um, so I'm, I'm newish on the school committee, so I wondered why um, with this question about uh, the eligibility for submitting the SOIs, why if the school is not overcrowded, why, what, what, why does that make a difference? So so the school cannot be overcrowded. Um, one of the, if the MSBA goes out and visits a school that they feel is overcrowded, they feel there may be a future project that's maybe an addition renovation that may impact an investment for an accelerator repair program project. So if you replace uh, the windows or the roof at a building or a boiler, boiler within a, a building that's currently overcrowded, 
um, there may be a future project that may Im negatively impact a capital project, construction project, that may impact their investment. So overcrowding uh, speaks to other issues within that building and the district. Okay, I, I, I'm just trying to make sense of it because it seems like a school that is overcrowded would need more um, support and um, expansion maybe or renovation within that building. Just curious what. So that would be more likely moved to a core program submission for the accelerator um, for the MSBA program. So there's like a different source of funding for those types of things? It all comes from the uh, sales tax. It's just that they offer two programs. One is roof windows and boilers and the core program deals with uh, major uh, structural deficiencies, overcrowding, and those types of issues within a, a school building. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. And, and just to follow on that, um, the city's made over the last five years um, a number of investments under the core program as well, uh, somewhere in um, maybe about $90 million or so. Yeah, up <coughs> we, we uh, 100 and I think it was 80, $124 million dollars in reimbursement uh, from the MSBA for between Dearborn, I'm sorry, total construction costs. Mm -hmm with uh, $86 million in reimbursement between the Dearborn and the Bostock Skyline. Okay. And um, when the city does go, or any district goes to the uh, MSBA to seek um, a reimbursement, um, in addition to this ARP program, the Accelerated Repair Program that um, focuses on these um, assets that can extend the life of a building, we also have the opportunity to um, seek reimbursement for either new construction or a renovation of an existing building. And the MSBA sits tip, the MSBA doesn't grant every application, um, but they do, uh, when they do grant an application, it's at a separate rate, depending on whether it's a new building or a, um, uh, a renovation. And then I think there's a number of other calculations that go into that, but um, traditionally, and the thing that I, the number that I always come back to, and I'm just speaking to the superintendent about this in uh, these presentations is that in the, uh, the 10 years that preceded uh, this administration, we sought about $6 million total um, in reimbursement from the MSBA. And in the five years since uh, 2015, uh, we're now at uh, roughly $125 million in reimbursement tonight. With these 11 that we'll be seeking um, a vote on next week, that I, I believe that brings us to 38 projects that have uh, fallen under the, um, the umbrella of the, uh, the M MSBA, uh, excuse me, ARP specifically. ARP, correct. Yep. during that period in addition to the core projects so yeah we have we're involved with the, uh, with the M MSPR right now on four core four core pro program projects Dearborn completed Boston Arts Academy in construction Josiah Quincy slated to start in the summer of 2021 and the Carter school would be starting soon after that okay so we're really looking forward to you know continuing to make better use um, and the, the use that we have been making um, over the last uh, half dozen years uh, with um, the MSBA, uh, with the projects that are coming online. We'll continue to look to MSBA as a, a source for build BPS in future years as well. Um, and I thank you for specifically the way that you've broken out the 11 schools this year, um, showing the neighborhood, showing the specific projects, but also that OI score. Um, and uh, Brian, I don't believe you have uh, the OI score averages, but um, what I would like to understand, I think we've seen this in some of the presentations before, and perhaps you can send this to us before the vote next week, is what's the average OI score in the district um, so that we can compare that against uh, the, uh, the schools that were uh, selected mm -hmm. for um, work in this, um, uh, in this uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, filibustering for a minute because uh, Ms. Reyes has an additional question. I want to make sure she has time. Yeah, I would just like to know if um, if there are regulations around like the environmental impacts that these renovations have in schools and how those are mitigated? I think we look at all the schools um, throughout the district, again, bringing forward those that would fit most in line with the MSBA requirements. But one of the big things we want to make sure is that uh, we're replacing windows that are clouded or aren't allowing the, the natural light into the, uh, the learning environment. We wanna make sure we're, we're replacing boilers in schools that may have a uneven heat distribution. You could have one classroom that's 
85 degrees and one that's 65 degrees. So we want to make sure we're, we're working in schools that will um, replacing systems that would positively impact the learning environment for for these students. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Reyes, and I know uh, climate change is a big issue for uh, BSAC, so we thank you for raising that issue. Um, Ms. Robinson, you had an additional yes, question. thank you. Um, given the work of Build BTS 72, at this point, do you have an assessment of all current 135 buildings in terms of these 11 have come to the top for these reasons? Do we really understand what's going on in all of our buildings so there aren't surprises like the West Roxbury? piece and what are the and, and how are those recommendations um, being moved forward I understand you have several pots of money where things can go so how do we do we have that bigger picture for the whole district I think we have a lot of information that was captured in the site visits two or three years ago uh, from the consultant team that had their teams go out and out go out and visit every school um, that's two or three years old now mm -hmm. so a lot of the work that PFD uh, does with the BPS, BPS facilities team is to rely on their uh, knowledge of the buildings day in and day out to put forward the not only in the for MSBA funding but in the capital plan we put forward those schools in the scope of work <coughs> that um, are constantly in need of being addressed uh, continued repair at a certain building uh, for a certain building system um, or whatever it may be, we rely heavily on working with BPS facilities team to identify the appropriate projects to move forward uh, for requests in the capital program. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Robinson. And, um, you know, to that point, I appreciate you raising that question because, you know, when we did have the closure with West Roxbury a few years ago, we identified that s those 70s era buildings uh, that, you um, had similar design and, and construction characteristics, and that's actually how we, we came, if you recall, uh, came to understand uh, the critical nature of the Jackson Man Building, which is uh, a similar building. Um, and I think in the district, generally, we have three classes of buildings, those buildings that were built probably in the last three decades that are you know pretty sound uh, as far as design is concerned. That 70s uh, era uh, of buildings that we have a lot of concerns on and uh, about and we, we keep a close eye on. And then those, um, those largely brick buildings that are pre-World War II that um, uh, are uh, um, very sturdy uh, but not always uh, m uh, the most um, flexible buildings for us to, uh, to grow within. Um, and so each of them, each of these three, and uh, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian. Um, th that's the way I typically look at these buildings. Yeah, you, you nailed it. And, and unfortunately, the some of the strongest buildings in the district are the older buildings. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, they don't provide the spaces to support a 21st century educational program. Right. Um, unflexible classroom design. Um, a lot of them weren't built with cafeterias, so we had right. kids eating the eating in the basement. Right. Um, they don't support art, music. Thank you. And thank you again, Ms. Robinson. Superintendent, you had something to add. Yeah, so thank you, um, uh, Ms. Robinson. Th we are, we're not here tonight yet to present the capital request budget, um, but just so you know, we have also um, issues that we have put forth to the city in that request for our water, bathrooms, painting, safe entries to the school, safety and for our entries, um, welcoming entries for our school and uh, other other um, maintenance items and upgrades for our school. So we'll be presenting that when we get that back from the city to the school committee at a later date. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you again, Mr. McLaughlin. We'll look forward to seeing you next week when we take action on this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on now to our next report, which is our annual hiring update from the Office of Human Capital. At this time, I'd like to invite the following people to please step forward with their presentation. Uh, Mr. Al Taylor, our Chief Human Capital Officer. Mr. Stephen Chen, our Deputy Chief Human Capital Officer. And welcome back, Mr. Chen. Uh, uh, Saren Daly, our Managing Director of Recruitment, Cultivation, and Diversity Programs. Uh, Ms. Monica Hall, the Administrative Professional Growth Specialist. Mr. John Barrows, our uh, Director of Data and Analytics. Ladies, gentlemen, welcome, and uh, you have our attention.
Director Person Lacanto, uh, Vice Chair Olivia Davia, and Superintendent Dr. Casalio. My name is Albert Taylor. I'm the Chief Human Capital Officer. I'm joined by the human capital team of Stephen Chen, Sam and Daly, Monica Hall, and John Barrows. Our presentation tonight will focus on diversity hiring as a result of Boston still being under the Judge Garrity order for hiring <coughs> black and minority guidance counselors. We're gonna frame our presentation in three buckets, hiring, recruitment and cultivation, and retention. Despite the national challenge of insufficient pool of teachers of color, Boston uses innovative strategies to maintain our efforts to hire racially and linguistically diverse teachers and leaders. On the recruitment and cultivation, DPS continues to build and cultivate diverse educated candidate pool by maintaining strong partnerships with colleges and universities and building out homegrown pipelines with our DPS high schools. Under retention, DPS continues to retain racially, ethnically, and ling linguistically diverse educators through targeted retention efforts, outreach, and access to MTEL preparation assistance. In this next slide, we wanted to um, share a little bit about the education landscape um, in Massachusetts. And uh, this is um, the outsized market share that DPS has within um, the state in terms of our educators of color. So you see here that BPS employs um, just about 6% of all educators within the state. And statewide, 8% um, uh, of Massachusetts educators identify as people of color. 3% uh, identify as black, 3% identify as Latinx, and 2% identify as Asian. Yet within the BPS workforce, 47% of all black teachers within the state work for BPS. 23% <coughs> of all Latinx teachers within the state work for BPS. And 23% of all Asian teachers within the state work for BPS. Um, so this showcases both um, the challenge that we face in terms of the uh, educator pool statewide and also the um, hard work that our district has done to diversify our workforce. So we wanted to start off by sharing our hiring for this last school year. And um, what you'll see here is for our teachers and guidance counselors in 2019, which is illustrated in the rightmost column, we had the highest total percent of teachers of color hired in the past six years at 47%. Out of those, more than 25% identified as black and more than 15% identified as Latinx, both of which represent the highest rate in each of those demographics over the last six years. When we see this hiring rate, um, when we, what we see in this hiring rate is that the hiring initiatives, which we'll share a little bit later in this presentation, we believe they are making a difference in setting mindsets and helping with the hiring practices in our schools. However, one key thing to note in, this num uh, in these numbers is that in these past years, we also had the lowest number of vacancies um, at 931. So we see this as both a good and bad thing. The positive is that a lower vacancy rate means that we have fewer educators leaving our system. But fewer vacancies also means that there are fewer opportunities to move the needle on diversity. In addition to this, we also wanted to share that we did a deeper analysis this year for the first time on the candidates of color who applied to BPS last year who were ultimately not hired. And just some of the data that we found out was that about 50% of the time, these candidates, um, they were not hired, and the reason why was because another candidate of color was hired into those positions. In addition, approximately 20% of the time, the candidate of color was applying but didn't have the license for the position they applied to. For, so for exi example, uh, you might have an English teacher position and that candidate did not hold a uh, license to teach English. What we're really excited about is this last group, which about 20% of these candid uh, of candidates um, that didn't result in hires, 23% of them had the appropriate license and applied to BPS, but they applied to five or fewer positions in the system. In addition, there's another 20% or so that they applied to 10 or fewer positions. And so what we see in this group of about 40% of, of, of the candidates is that they meet these two key criteria. Number one, they were interested in working in BPS because they applied to a position 
And number two, they have the licenses for positions they applied for. So one key thing that we're going to be doing this year, working with our recruitment team, is to reach out to each of these candidates um, who, who did apply to five or ten fewer positions and um, connect with them, learn a little bit more about who they are, and also try to connect them with opportunities that they might not have considered or didn't know about um, that were available in, the, uh, in our hiring availability. Um, so now I'm going to turn to Monica, who's going to talk a little about our school leader hiring past year. Thank you, Stephen. So this, um, this current year, we hired about 75% new school leaders of color. Um, when you look at the chart on the left, um, you'll notice that we have um, 128 school leaders in our district. 40% are black and 9% are Latinx. At the end of the 2018-19 school year, we had 15 school leaders to exit the district as shown by the graph in the middle. Overall, there were 22 school leader vacancies in the district, which included three lateral moves and four retirements. Out of the 22 new hired school leaders, 10 were black and five were Latinx. We need to concentrate our efforts on increasing the number of Latinx and Asian school leaders to come to parity with the percent represented in our school population. Um, we want to do that by having persistent efforts, by having a customer service approach in the work we do in recruitment and cultivating our school leaders. Um, therefore, we have increased the number of recruitment events. We have extended our outreach to internal and external affinity groups, such as Alana, Teachers Lounge, and Amplified Latinx. We're working to expand our networks um, within the Chinese and Vietnamese communities. We have focused outreach by cold calling and reaching out to professionals who have experienced being school leaders in urban districts by using the LinkedIn um, platform. Also, we are explicitly communicating with our pipeline partners, such as Lint, Teach for America, Peron Sizer Institute, and Harvard, that we have prioritized um, hiring and recruiting leaders of color. Uh, we're also working on ways to create our own cohort by working with local universities and organizations. Also this year, we have established a system principal training um, and also other administrative team members are involved in this training too as well. For the upcoming year, we plan to create a bridge program to help our current leaders in the assistant principal and school administrative roles to transition if they would like into a school leadership role. Um, this year we are uh, re-energized and we are ready um, to position ourselves to ensure that we can recruit and hire leaders that reflect our student population. Now it's time for Saren to discuss our workforce diversity. Thank you, Monica. BPS has sustained and slightly grown our workforce diversity over the last six years. This is substantial because during the same period of peer districts across the country experienced double digit loss among their black educators and minimal to no increases in their Latinx educators. There, m there are many factors that impact our workforce diversity data. Stephen and Monica have shared with you our data highlighting our school leaders of color hires and our educators of color hires. As you review our data, I will highlight some of these factors. When, when employees are on leave, such as medical or parental leave, they're not counted in our active educator data. This is significant because close to 24% of the employees on leave in 2019 were black compared to 19% the prior <coughs> year. In addition to leaves of absence, our educator data is impacted by either resignations or retirements. Over the percent of exits who identified as black, overall, the percent of exits who identified as black was proportional to the wor workforce for the second year in a row, though there are significant variations by exit reason. Black teachers are underrepresented in resignations. They resigned at significantly lower rates than their proportion to the, to the workforce. 13% of resignations were black teachers. 
18% of retirements were Latinx, considering that they are 10.7% of our workforce, and 8% of retirements were Asian, considering they are 6% of the workforce. Black teachers were overrepresented in retirements. Nearly 30% of retirements were black. This is consistent with prior years and what we would expect from the age demographics going forward. For instance, approximately 32% of black teachers are over 50 years old, compared to 25% of Latinx, 21% of white teachers, and approximately 18% of Asian teachers. Given all these factors, our total number of exits remained almost the same. This year, 361 educators left our district as compared to 360 last year. Despite these challenges, we still have, ma we still have made progress against our goals, <coughs> while many other urban districts have seen declines in diversity. While we are proud of our results, we're also acutely aware that much more work needs to be done to meet our goals of reducing our students and staff diversity gap. <coughs> in the past few slides, you were able to review the percentage of teachers of color <coughs> hired in the last six years. Last year's school leader hiring outcomes and our overall teacher and guidance counselor diversity data for the last six years. This slide provides you with a snapshot of our overall workforce diversity. From left to right, the first column refers to our educators. The second column to all school-based staff. The third column highlights our staff in the bowling building. And the column to the far right reflects our total district diversity. For the district to continue to reduce the racial, cultural, and linguistic diversity gap between students and staff, strategic change is needed at both the central office and individual schools. Stephen? So another key aspect we wanted to highlight was um, an initiative that I know OHC has brought forward in front of school committee in the past, which is the diversity-focused schools. So starting in 2016, BPS, um, OHC, um, along with the Office of Equity, as well as other uh, key partners, have um, identified diversity-focused schools, which are schools that, number one, had less than 35% teachers of color and number two, had fewer than, or had at least three vacancies anticipated at the start of the hiring season. And when a school is identified as a diversity focused school, they receive a number of additional supports during the hiring season, including training for sc uh, the school leader on topics including how to eliminate racial bias in hiring at all stages, from reviewing resumes to the interview stage to the performance task stage. Um, these schools also receive schools with lists of candidates of color, uh, access to early candidates, recruitment fairs, extra supports from our staffing team. And um, what we see in this data is when we first started this work, that blue line on the left graph shows that 29% of the hires in the first year when we did diversity focused schools, 29% um, of the, the hires from those schools were um, ended up hiring candidates of color. When we moved to 2019, what we see is actually that 50% of the candidates that were hired by diversity focus schools were candidates of color, which actually is the highest rate in the district. So in other words, the diversity focus schools are actually leading the way now in terms of hiring um, educators of color. In addition to that, as these initiatives gone on, another key thing to highlight is that the um, percentage of candidates that speak f uh, another language, that fluency in another language has also gone up. So one key thing that we're really excited about in terms of this information is we are now taking the trainings that we piloted with the diversity focus schools and this hiring season, every school leader is going to be getting these trainings. And so as we identify the next group of diversity focus schools, the big question and, and the key work that we're working on is how do we take this work, which we've kind of raised the floor, how do we find these diversity focus schools and then start thinking about what's the next step, what's the next level to start um, to, 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 uh, to, to make meaningful impacts um, in, in our hiring. Thanks, Stephen. We've learned from our experience in Boston and from national trends that recruitment and hiring alone will not be enough to truly move the needle on workforce diversity. We need to address <coughs> the root causes. That's why BPS has built multiple pathways to support future teachers of color 
to enter the system. On the left-hand side of this slide, we highlight our new university partners, BU Wheelock, Eastern Nazarene College, <coughs> Regis College, and UMass Boston. Our university partners support both our cultivation and recruitments and retention strategies. This year, Regis offers a flexible and affordable opportunity for paraprofessionals and other staff to complete their post-secondary education and earn their bachelor's degree, which is a prerequisite to becoming a teacher. BU Wheelock, Regis, and UMass all offer affordable reduced tuition, opportuni <coughs> tuition opportunities for all BPS employees with a bachelor's degree to earn a master's degree in several programs of study. <coughs> this year, Eastern Nazarene College has partnered with BPS to provide members of our women's and men's educator of color leadership programs with postgraduate certificate with a postgraduate certificate of leadership. BPS strategically partners with several teacher preparation programs in Massachusetts to better cultivate diverse candidates throughout the application and hiring process. These teacher preparation partners are vastly more diverse than statewide averages and focus specifically on preparing their students to teach in BPS. This year, our three partners, the Boston Teacher Residency Program, Teach Next Year, and Boston College Donovan Urban Scholars programs collectively enabled us to hire 46 new educators of color. Last year, we were able to hire 47 educators of color. The Office of Human Capital has designed and launched a portfolio of pipeline development programs intended to cultivate the city's racially, culturally, and linguistically diverse community to grow our own highly qualified educators. These programs, while modest in scale in their early phases, represents a promising long-term sustainable solution to persistent workforce diversity challenges, both in Boston and nationwide. Our high school to teacher program currently has 32 high school students and 21 BPS alums in college, 13 freshmen and eight sophomores. The high school to teacher program will expand into the teacher cadet program a much more comprehensive initiative serving students both in schools and district-wide. The Teacher Cadet Program will identify opportunities for students to enroll in undergrad education programs, return to BPS as summer teaching assistance, and prepare for certification by enrolling in our own BPS MTEL prep courses as undergrads. Let me introduce Angel. Angel is a senior from ISTE who was selected to introduce Mayor Walsh at his State of, a, uh, State of the City address. We look forward to Angel returning to BPS over the summers while he's in college, to working in our summer school programs and participating in our summer MTEL prep courses. Angel plans to be a BPS ESL teacher. Superintendent Casilius is committed to hiring any BPS alum graduating from the teacher cadet program who wishes to return to teach in BPS. Regis College leads the way in supporting the development of the teacher cadet program. Beginning the fall of 2020, Regis has committed to providing two full tuition scholarships for any BPS senior admitted. All of our efforts to recruit highly effective, racially, culturally, and linguistically diverse teachers and leaders, school leaders are futile if we don't have a similar and robust effort to retain and develop these educators. Over the last five years, we've seen an increase in the number of provisional educators of color being non-renewed, specifically black and Latinx educators. This increase is driven entirely by non-renewal due to licensure. BPS is retaining provisional educators of color that are non-renewed due to license at higher rates than white provisional educators. BPS is working intensively to hire teachers of color including teachers on waivers because of the statewide shortage of teachers of color. As a result, we're now non-renewing a larger share of our provisional teachers of color. However, we have aggressively focused on rehiring and retaining as many of these as educators as possible. In addition to the MTEL prep support, Rashawn Martin, our newest staff member, and our educator of color retention specialist has communicated with all non-renewed provisional teachers of color. Through our focused efforts, 
we were able to retain 89% of the educators of color that were non-renewed due to no license. Last year, we increased our investment to provide extensive MPEL support to provisionals on waivers, BPS paraprofessionals and substitutes, and members of our own internal pipeline programs. Akita Naran Kapir, our MTEL prep and ESL mentoring specialist, has designed a comprehensive, multi-tiered support that begins with an online assessment, includes whole group classes, small group reviews, one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, and individual at-home study plans. In addition to funding a full-time position and MTEL, MTEL test vouchers, BPS has, BPS has secured funds from DESE to expand and offer more summer programs. This slide shares the outcomes of our targeted MPEL prep support. We've highlighted our pass rates of our educators of color who participate <coughs> in our MTEL prep programs and have shared their results after taking their test. Please note that the orange bar indicates the pass rate for our black and Latinx educators, and the blue bar reflects the past black and Latina, I'm sorry, reflects the black and Latinx educators state pass rate. In closing, I want to take this time to thank my team for all the work they've done to recruit, cultivate, and develop our future educators and current educators. And when I mean uh, educators, I mean all of our educators, but specifically educators who reflect the racial, cultural, and linguistic diversity of the students that we serve. Um, my team is back here. It's Kim Conley, who's Director of Recruitment, Cultivation, and Diversity Programs. She, along with Jeremy Daly, our Manager of Recruitment and Cultivation, spearhead a lot of our recruitment work. Rashawn Martin, I've mentioned before, is our Educator of Color Retention Specialist. Akita Naran Kapur is our MTEL genius um, and has developed an initiative, as you see, that are really focused on supporting our greatest need. Charles Page, a Hampton alum, is homesick, <laughs> dealing with the bug that's probably going around for everyone, but he's our program coordinator. And finally, Wences Raphael, who heads our high school teacher program. Thank you. So looking ahead, and moving forward, under hiring, we will continue to implement strategic change at the school-based level. We'll continue diversity-focused school initiatives. We'll have school-level hiring and retention goals set by school leaders, and we will continue our focus on diversity, hiring, and leadership. Under recruitment and cultivation, we have restructured in, in human capital. We've added funding to add additional positions and, and have restructured and moved some things off Saren's plate so her team can just, just focus on recruitment <coughs> and cultivation, which is what they should be doing. Um, <coughs> we have an HBC initiative to recruit HBC alums. We have DESE grants to support diversity recruitment, loan payment reimbursement, relocation assistance, and signing bonuses. We will engage with Latinx groups and Asian groups and community leaders to continue the conversation to look for ent entry points that, that will help us recruit Latinx and Asian candidates. We'll target liberal arts programs at colleges and universities um, to, to try to recruit educators there, uh, um, to try to recruit people there to come into education. We'll increase cultivation events to increase diversity and early hiring pools. We'll strengthen and build out our BPS teacher cadet program, especially since Dr. Cafell is keeps telling us we need to do that. So we're looking forward to doing that. Under retention, we will continue to provide targeted and individualized outreach and support to all educators of colors and conduct exit interviews whenever we have anybody of color leave the system and try to figure out why that's happening. We're going to expand the MTEL prep support that will include bilingual education endorsement and we'll expand our, our university and partnerships to increase access to Paris and other BPS staff to earn their BAs and or master's de degrees um, at a reduced and an affordable cost. Um, we have additional HR people behind us, so we'll be able to answer questions and look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Taylor, and thank you again for bringing out your team and, and uh, for introducing them tonight. I know there's a number of you in the audience who we haven't 
uh, had an opportunity to uh, have introduced. If there's anyone else uh, that's in the audience from OHC, if you would just mind raising your hand if we didn't get a chance to introduce you. Well, thank you again for all your hard work here. Uh, we're going to look. Uh, we're going to move to um, members for uh, questions and discussion now, and um, I'll look to uh, any of you that want to start off. Dr. Rivera. So thank you again. This is. Um, um, there's a lot of potential here. <laughs> you know, we we as as um, Ms. Hall pointed out. Um, you know, this wanting to have more of the representation. Um, clearly, our district is majority Latinx students, and um, you know these these numbers really need to, to increase as well for the Asian teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. I had a question about the the Garrity order again. I, I'm learning. Um, so if if it says you know we're supposed to be 25% black and 10% other minorities, um, you know in two, 2019, according to slide five, um, we are you know we've exceeded that. Um, so what would it what would it take then to n not have that you know sort of order on the school system or you know what is how do we get out of of that? Um, is, is it just one year? Is it a couple of years? I'm just curious how that's going to change. Yeah, so just one point of clarification about slide five is that that doesn't represent the overall workforce. Slide five represents the hiring for this school, this past school year. So what it's, it doesn't reflect that we have 20, I, sorry, I can't actually see the numbers. Can someone move it to slide five? Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm so, confused. so the actual district um, uh, demographics is on slide seven, and so essentially, what the Garrity order and I know Kathy, our, our uh, legal advisors here, but from my understanding, what the Garrity order requires us to do is to have a uh, staff that is twenty-five percent black and ten percent other minority, and the way that the court order sort of is satisfied isn't just to reach those numbers mm -hmm. it's also to determine if when if there is a three percent reduction in force in staff if there is that three percent reduction in force those numbers still remain 25 and 10. and so there have been years in the past when the district has reflected the demographics of 25 and 10 but it has never been satisfied because a three percent reduction in force if it were to happen the numbers of the 25 and 10 would go below the threshold. Oh, okay, so it's not just for teachers, it's still for staff, that's everyone. It's for um, the uh, educators who are teachers and guidance counselors. Teachers and guidance counselors. Okay, okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, uh, another quick question. Um, so you do exit interviews, or is there, are there, is that for everyone, or what percentage of the teachers that leave, teachers of color that leave, are you able to do exit interviews with? Moving forward, we're going to be doing that mm -hmm. so that we can understand why some of our teachers of color are leaving. Okay, so in the in the past, we haven't done exit interviews. We have conducted some exit surveys in the past, okay. um, but we've had limited success in the response rates. Okay. Um, and we had some te technical challenges with um, implementing and, and reaching out to folks um, based on when they lose access to their EPS email <coughs> addresses and whether or not we had another means of communication to reach out to them. Okay. Um, uh, also, was thank you. Um, was wondering about um, and maybe this is also for Dr. Caselius um, again another reference to a Globe article <laughs> <laughs> um, that um, Commissioner Riley is considering um, not having the MTEL mm -hmm. um, be a potential requirement. I'm curious what the school district's position is on that and maybe you could speak to it or other folks over here. Because I do think that, I know from my, um, having uh, teachers that come from Puerto Rico um, or from other states, um, it's a real challenge to pass that MTEL. Uh, so I'm just curious what our school district, um, how they might support that initiative from Riley. Dr. Rivera, I'll take that. Um, so I'd, I've not been secretive about my opinion about standardized tests and the use of one test to 
determine the measure of quality for student achievement or even educator achievement. I think the best way to understand the quality of an educator is to have an educator in a classroom through a residency program, and we see our graduate ed programs really moving to graduate graduate um, residency programs for our teachers and so and strong induction programs for our teachers so that we can grow them and help them. Um, you just can't learn how to be a great teacher out of a book. Um, you have to get practice, especially when you are working with a diverse population. And you, that's, it's in, you have to be masterful now in the teachers. And you heard that in the conversation today from our inclusion teachers and gen ed teachers who are trying to do this co-teaching model. So um, I'm very supportive of the commissioner and his work toward finding solutions um, to, to not only diversify our, our workforce, but to ensure that the teachers who do come have an understanding of deeper learning uh, and good pedagogy in order to have the instructional toolkit to serve all our children. Hi, I'm Akita. I'm the MTEL um, specialist in the district. Um, I'm going to speak about the MTEL and what Commissioner O'Reilly is doing from the perspective of actual educators that have to go through that process. And <coughs> Could you just explain what the MTEL is, yes. just for some of us? Yeah. So the MTEL is the Massachusetts Test for Educator Licensure, and it's re a required <coughs> series of assessments that are given to teachers to assess their content knowledge. Um, the commission has never said that they feel that the MTEL is a measure of teacher quality, actually. They say it's a measure of content knowledge. So they feel that teachers should possess adequate content knowledge in order to teach students. You must know the content of algebra to teach algebra. Mm -hmm. You must know how to teach children how to read so you can teach them how to read in the classroom. However, I agree with Dr. Casilius, and every single educator that's been in the classroom also knows that you must use multiple measures in measuring competency. Mm -hmm. MTEL is just one measure. However, I want to take, I want to answer like a broader question of why Dr. Um, Riley, I mean, yeah, Commissioner Riley is actually trying to change this because the MTEL, and this is nationwide of all teacher licensure exams, teacher licensure exams have been blocking our educators of color into the, um, to enter into teaching. But why is that? Are they not doing well? Why aren't they doing well on the assessments, on the, on the tests? And I'm going to argue based on the data that you see here. And, and actually, I just, you know, last week, actually, John uh, was, we were looking through our MTEL data. And I've, I have just put up the raw data and not this one. I have actually even more updated data that we have that we have to clean up still. But we did count. In two years, 182 passed scores in our program. The majority, I would say about 70% of them were black and Latinx. What is it that is happening with our black and Latinx teachers that's not happening across the state or across the country? Mm -hmm. Now this past year, there's been research that has been put out by different professors and different researchers on educator licensure exams. Emery Pachauer is one of them. He's at the University of the State State University of Michigan. And he posits that the licensure exams, the reason that teachers of color struggle with them is not because they lack the cognitive or the ability to pass them. If you look historically, this, like the BTU was here, our black and brown teachers were once our black and brown students. The majority of the people that have been in our BPS program have our BPS graduates. And I have a Brianne Brown, one of our instructors here, and we sit, we just finished our courses at Madison, and every week we sit there at nighttime around 8, 9 o'clock, with students, our black and brown teachers that are struggling with their exams, that sit with us, that sit with us and say, 
I wish I had learned this earlier. Why didn't I learn this earlier? It's about closing the gap. That's what you see here, and the same thing that goes for our children. So Emery Pachauer, you can call, you can say, use whatever assessment you want. MTEL, portfolio, whatever it is. It's about closing the gap with children that then go on to college with that content knowledge who then can all go back and teach our students. <coughs> and that's what our program is about. It's about closing gaps and instilling that growth mindset to achieve success. Very comprehensive, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Ms. Reyes. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if this is necessarily the appropriate approach to what I'm wondering about, but is there a way to track um, if teachers that are already in VPS that are of color are moved into leadership positions um, across the district, do we know if the vacancies that they've left are filled by other teachers of color, or like, is there a way to track that? Yes, I mean, we could certainly look at that um, over time, and, and I would posit that it's probably a mixed bag in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. Okay, thank you. I do think that that brings up a good point about whether we track by district, mm -hmm. um, that 3% ratio, or whether we, whenever we have a reduction, mm -hmm. or whether we track by school. Mm. We track by school, yeah. And I wonder how it's applied by the law and if Kathy could give us a, some, not now, but if you could look at the Garrity order and <coughs> if that would, if that would be a nuance within it that could help us also with retaining teachers of color. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions? There's also additional also information yeah. for you in your appendix. Well, thank you, Ms. Reyes. Uh, Ms. Robinson. Yes. Um, thank you for um, the presentation. Um, I was trying to understand a little bit about the fact that we've had teachers of color um, apply for positions and not be hired. Um, and I guess the question, and maybe this is what you're thinking about addressing as we go forward, um, I still see we're hiring a significant number of white teachers into places where we need more teachers of color, et cetera. And I guess my question would be why if we have um, teachers of color who are applying, who meet the criteria, why we would let them go without trying to find some place in s some other position so that we're not saying, well, 100 applied, 50 we hired, 50 went somewhere else, but we hired 400 white teachers. And so I guess that's what I'm concerned about, why any competent teacher of color is not somehow redirected to um, other positions in an ongoing way. Sure, um, there are a number of factors, of course, um, but one of the things that we looked at in the analysis that we did was, um, you know, what are some of the reasons that lead to some of those educators of color not being hired? Um, and there are certainly um, a, a number of issues that uh, we didn't look at in our analysis, but um, I think will probably play a, a role in terms of um, how well someone interviews. Um, you know, if they were interviewed and didn't do well in the interview, that could have an impact on whether or not they get offered a job, obviously. Um, but uh, there's also um, the question of whether or not there's a match between the vacancies that are available and the um, qualifications that candidates have. And one of the things that we saw in that 20% of applications that didn't result in a hire is that um, about half of the candidates that had submitted to those applications had applied in subject areas that receive, on average, between 80 to 110 applications per vacancy. So there's intense competition in certain um, select uh, program areas, but in other program areas there's really um, a lack of candidates available. So there may be some candidates out there, but there may not be the right fit of positions um, for those candidates. But in those, in those areas where 80 to 100 people applied, yeah. again, um, how many, I don't know how many positions there were, but how many of the recipients ended up being white versus people of color? And again, in those areas, is there a way of zooming in to try to make sure that, um, you know, I know, I know in, in other districts and other places, people will say, we're not going to fill this position unless we fill it with a 
person of color because we need to move our numbers forward, but we don't do that within the district. So the no, question is what encourages teachers of color or people of color to apply and feel when they know that there are many positions open that they may get that position versus mm -hmm. still seeing the inequities in how, you know, 50 years later we still are looking at who our educators are within the district. I know Al's gonna talk about <coughs> accountability, but I just wanna ref um, sort of respond to your question about sort of left on the table. Um, our analysis when we looked at just our black educators, we know 50% of them weren't hired because they weren't hired because another a, a candidate of color was hired. The group that was left not in a position, it was about 20%, and the analysis there was if you're applying to one, five, less than 10 positions, then you're, you're, not even, you're not in the mix to get a high enough volume to be considered. So in, a, a, in essence, it's as if they didn't really apply because they only applied to 10. Our solution this year is figuring out if that's the case, then for our recruitment team, a lot of the effort's going to be applied to more. Hey, there's some customized, let me help you match. And at the end of this year, if we're seeing that be mitigated, then we'll look at what's left as a reason. But we're being really intentional about trying to figure out the what. And once we determine and learn something, how do we build strategies to support? But I also think the other side of accountability is going to answer a little bit more about the incentive part. Yeah, moving forward, all of our schools now have school level accountability goals, diversity hiring goals. That they will be monitored by the school superintendents working with the school leaders. Um, and as Stephen mentioned earlier in his presentation, we're going to also be doing a lot of diversity training for all of our schools now. So every there's a higher level of accountability and we'll be able to track really what's going on in some of the schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in terms of the retention issue, um, schools that you know are being encouraged to hire diversity, what's going on in those buildings that is helping with training mm -hmm. that's going to be enable them to continue to keep their diversity because they've created environments that welcome the diversity versus being forced to create right. or open up to. I think an important thing to think about when you hear diversity um, benchmarks, it's a recognition that it's both an intake, it's both recruiting and retaining. Mm -hmm. So part of our training isn't only about thinking about removing bias in your selection of having folks come into your buildings, is to really be intentional about what strategies you're using for retention and encouraging folks to reach out to our team mm -hmm. to help um, to support them. So that number isn't just based on how many folks I've kept, I've brought into my building. There's an assessment of how many folks you've also um, c retained. Mm -hmm. So that's also part of the accountability. Yeah. Sarah's team, uh, we've added staffing to Sarah's team and the recruitment component of her team will monitor and keep track of all of our educators of colors and try to support them and work with those schools. Uh, Stephen mentioned that we're gonna be training all, those all of our schools. Um, you wanna talk a little bit about that and what that training actually will just consist of? Yeah, so when we talk about the training, um, a lot of this work is going to be um, along with the Office of Equity. And as Saren mentioned earlier, there's the retention piece, but when we talk about the hiring piece, a lot of it is actually mindset setting mm -hmm. when it comes to um, how you review resumes, right? We know that there is a there there is a a way that is predominant in terms of this is what a resume should look like. Some of that is also saying look beyond just the format of the resumes. Mm -hmm. Look at also what's in the content of the resumes. Look at what you're seeing beyond that. We talk about the questions that we answer, right? Um, some people get a lot of resume and interview training as part of just their professional growth, and others they don't have that. And so looking beyond just the, the exterior presentation of someone who's interviewing for a position. And so these are all things that are built into the, the training that was for the diversity focus schools that now, you know, as you saw some of those proof points, we're intending to do for all school leaders moving forward. And then when we have educators of colors that are not comfortable, we try to find a better match for them in another school so that we do retain them. 
the last thing, and I'm not sure if this goes to you, Dr. Casarius, or not, but I know we've heard it a couple of times tonight and in the past when and schools are coming before us around um, cuts in their budget, and they'll also equate the loss of staff of color as part of that. So the question is, is last hired, first fired? Um, and is that, again, just making our efforts a revolving door in terms as schools are unstable with their funding or perceptions thereof? So some of those decisions, you're correct, are made at the school level. But again, with our retention team, we'll try to reach out, aggressively reach out to those educators of color <coughs> and try to find them matches or positions somewhere else in the district. Um, not much we can do about some of those decisions at the school level, but hopefully that won't happen. Um, we do have a focus on 33 of our schools where we're adding four positions in all of those buildings and certainly we'll find matches for a lot of our educators of color in those areas. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Robinson, there are some other things that we can have in our toolkit too around teacher retention and teachers of color in terms of um, <coughs> awarding permanent um, teacher status, allows us to keep them um, and that would then help them with bumping and that kind of thing in terms of, um, in terms of their uh, teacher availability at that school. Um, so I think that we have to explore all avenues. Um, I was just heard you, uh, Mr. Taylor, say that if a teacher of color um, it feels uncomfortable at a school, you work with them to try to find another school. Yes. Um, also work with me yeah. to try to fix that school culture that's happening. Um, and so I, that just caught my ear, and I'm certain that that you know, attitude reflects leadership, and so um, tone is set at the top. And so if you ever get those, please let me know. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Dr. Coleman. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is, um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I have so many hats in around this, but I just com I've just been cleaving lit with you on, on teacher diversity, and you are a model for the country. Um, I hope that someone stops and starts writing this up so we can share this story more broadly. Uh, when I came to this district 12 years ago, the Office of Human Capital, as it was called, it wasn't called that then, was clearly understood as the weak link for the district. It was just not a good place. It wasn't part of our strength, and now you've become, I think, part of our strong foundation. So kudos to you. This is a great accomplishment and really fantastic to listen to and, and um, you know, just wonderful. So that's my yes and now my and. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll kind of go uh, slide by slide. First, I know that I'm sure in the Garrity order they use the old language, but we're school counselors now, they're not guidance counselors. So just, just want to uh, put that on slide number eight. Um, uh, slide number nine, uh, thank you for explaining that to me. It wasn't clear at the beginning what that actually meant. It was a very useful explanation. And I'm wondering whether um, um, one of the things I think we need to commend uh, the district for is increasing substantively uh, the diversity at the principal level and the central office level. So how that contributes to decisions and the conversations that, m that are enriched that may in a <coughs> district that has significant uh, school-based autonomies, um, and, we, and some of us feel that's a good thing. I know there are other arguments. Having to deal with uh, leaders of color uh, in those conversations I think only helps, and so that may explain one of the drastic inclusion of, of the um, increase in the cohort, so that's really wonderful. Um, in slide number nine, uh, in terms of the pipeline, uh, slide number 10, um, our, uh, we'd love to hear in the next presentation some articulation on the pipeline for specialists psychologists, nurses, uh, school counselors, et cetera, et cetera, another area usually at the graduate level that I think is, vi is very, very important. And in that pipeline, uh, just kind of put it, throw it on my other hat, uh, we at BU Wheelock would love it if you put pressure on our admissions office to dedicate more of our community scholarships mm -hmm. to BPS students who want to be teachers. Yes. Please, please, we need your pressure to make those changes. I can see Dr. I can see Dr. Casilius mm -hmm. informing yeah. um, the growth of our teacher cadet program yes. with adding new university partners with yeah. that same very thing. So you, as you know, BU puts as That's much right. money as anyone on the table for BPS graduates, yep. but they don't necessarily dedicate it to um, this 
College of Education. So we want your help on, on, on that work. Uh, I guess my president's gonna see this in live, as I can't That's deny. Right. And, and, and I just wanna say real quick, I look forward to working with Colin Rose and going out to some of those universities and putting that type of pressure there. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we've already had some of those conversations. Mm -hmm. And then and another point, in, in addition to HCBUs, which is a great activity, I would add Latino serving institutions. I mean, just and, and, and I'm bringing that into our language because mm -hmm. yep. that's a growing population. Uh, it's amazing some of the universities that you find out that are now Latino serving. Um, and, and is that another connection that we need to make nationally? So I would add that. Um, uh, and coming down to uh, slide number 18. So in the review I'm doing, I know I know the emphasis on MTEL, it's very important. It, it caught a lot of attention. But going back to the conversation we heard earlier about uh, inclusion, um, one of the drivers for the difficulty in recruiting teachers of color are the working conditions of being a teacher in this country. Mm. It is overly demanding. Uh, once you get in there, uh, dropout rate, we got teachers come in, the average is a three-year tenure. Um, the turnover is just horrific. We are actually ahead of the country in our retention, but working conditions, I'm not saying this to my peers more than you, it's the work conditions of teachers, how much time they have, the ability to provide them support that really uh, allows for teachers to stay and be attractive. The, one of the primary reasons that um, students of color don't go into teaching is their parents tell them not to. Completely, in my lifetime, that's a revolution. Teachers don't encourage their students, their children to become teachers. It's not financial, it's really working conditions. So when we think about uh, the superintendent has established she wants to be one of the best, us to be one of the best places to work, how we treat teachers, the conditions we provide for them is gonna be central for that. And as we improve in that level, I think our diversity will go up. Um, and then, um, the next comment I'd like to ask, what's not here, some things that's not here that I'd be very interested in learning about, not today, don't have to come up with it, is what are we doing to assess the culture and uh, the competence of all of our teachers to work with culturally and linguistically diverse students? How are we getting at that? How are we reporting that our principals, our teachers, our school counselors, our nurses, how do we assess that so we have a real sense of their, uh, that part of the competence. I know we do the teacher competence and reviews, but how do we really articulate that? I really encourage us to put some time and investment or get partners to help invest in thinking about how do we know they have the skills to work with our students regardless of their background. Um, that'd be one thing. And then what's also not here that I'd be very interested in, as I think I'm known to be a true advocate of this human, our human capital, uh, changes over the past f uh, five years. So the data this, that we, we didn't report, because I think the focus on diversity is very important, very needed, and very and, and, and wonderfully presented. One of the things that we, we found, what was it, six, eight years ago, that only 13, 14% of our principals were doing the reviews. I mean, they, they were not reviewing their, um, their, their, their faculty yeah, yeah. and they were just letting and then not hiring and so we, we made this massive investment to improve, to make sure that if you had enough of your reviews done, you had that independence in hiring and um, I would like to get see that data again. How are we doing on that? Are the reviews being made? Are they doing the, their, their, are they, are they f creating the type of faculty that they work well in the school? And what's the impact on the diversity of the faculty? I think we want to look at that can go two ways. We want that data. And also those, those and for those uh, who are not yeah. being reassigned in a school, how, how long is it taking to get them to get in, get in a new position and how are we managing that? So that's another bit of data that we've historically gotten. That when I'm you say review, you're talking about evaluation data? I went, well, one, um, are our principals still, we got up to what, 90 some percent mm -hmm. of principals evaluating all their faculty by December so they could have autonomy in hiring? Yep. Are we still there? Yes. And then second, as they then let people, as they allow people to, as it really allow them to rearrange their faculty, are we still hiring earlier in the pool because we had the, the yes. we had that, we gave yes. that 
Freedom to Teachers. We had this great relationship with our union. Again, a national model for how to manage hiring yeah, yeah. And, and the quality of schools because, you know, not everyone agrees with this data, but I certainly do. The, p the primary way you improve performance in schools, the quality of the teacher you have in the classroom. Mm -hmm. that, that is the driver for improvement. So the freedom we gave uh, principals to create that quality in the classroom, I think is central to any improvement we're gonna do. So are we still providing that? And what are the outcomes on percentage of teachers of color? And are people, are we still caring <coughs> for those teachers who are saying, this is not a good fit in my school, we don't have the relationship. Or we're, we need these type of uh, skill sets for our students in this building. And are those faculty who are being um, released still being cared for and brought back into our system and taken care of? And so that, that was a data that was historically been reported that I would still like to see. Okay. Again, that those are, you know, just you know, icing on what is this a great cake. So thank you for your great work, and it's a, it's a real, it may, it's part of what makes me proud to be associated with, with this district because of the work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Coleman. Mr. O'Neill. So I'm gonna, in a slightly different way, echo a number of things that Dean Coleman just said um, because it is important, and so. Um, what, what you said, Dean Coleman, about a number of years ago, and it's a problem of you and I sitting here for a while. Mm -hmm. A number of years ago, when I asked school leaders. I'm also getting old. You, you stay young. <laughs> you know, not you can tell by this. Um, a number of school leaders, whenever I asked what was the worst department, or what was the best department in um, then Court Street, now Bowling Building, and then which one presented the most challenges, it was always the finance department was the best and the old HR department was the worst. And Mr. Taylor, you're fairly new to this role. I'm sure you'd be the first to share um, praise with your immediate two predecessors in the role who turned it around, and Ms. Daly and others who have been working on this for a number of years, who turned this around so that now school leaders say Office of Human Capital as opposed to the old HR is the best department to deal with in the bowling building. No disrespect to the finance team. They're probably back upstairs working on the budget at this point. <laughs> they were here earlier. Um, but I hear a lot of praise about Office of Human Capital. In particular, they say, you put us through the paperwork. Like, we have a lot of work to do, but you are fantastic to deal with. And to me, the proactive way that this office has worked to take on challenges such as this, but also implement huge changes, so mutual consent, which Dean Coleman was referencing as well, was the single most positive change in my mind that this district has made in the past 10 years and has fundamentally changed how school leaders can work with their teams and put together their schools. And I know there's some outside research going on on that and I look forward to that. I think it should be coming out sometime, right? Because there have been some researchers looking at the effectiveness of that, of that program. But and, and Dean Coleman hit the nail on the head. These numbers show us the outcomes um, on ethnicity. What you don't have in this is what we traditionally get in this report as well is about the timing. And it could, to me, it's about hiring the best possible teacher for our classes, for our students. And I think changing the timing has been fundamental to that change. Um, and yes, I agree completely, um, Dean Coleman, the huge effort that we as a body put on to hold every level of the district accountable. We fundamentally believed that everyone who works in the district has, to be right to be, has a right to be told, <coughs> what are you doing right and where can you improve? And we held the school leaders or we held the superintendent's feet to the fire to hold school leaders accountable for doing reviews of all your students, uh, of all their teachers, and we got that report at this level just to show how important it was and that deputy superintendents were evaluating all the principals and school leaders that they report to and were all evaluations for school leaders in on time and was the superintendent evaluating their senior team, showing that every single, and by the way, it was important on us to evaluate the superintendent on a timely basis as well. We were trying to prove that point that everyone had that responsibility. So I would be interested in, Mr. Taylor, you were nodding your head yes when Dean Coleman brought it up, and I think he was saying that yes, the reviews are going on. Yes. But we'd love to see that data 
at each of the levels to make sure our school leaders are getting timely evaluations by their superiors uh, mm -hmm. or supervisors, et cetera. Um, lastly, I think Dean Coleman briefly referenced, but we do have a pool of folks that may not be a right fit at one school, and where those numbers stand would be helpful to know as well. And I know we've had various methods involved from early retirement to um, coaching and training to help people mm -hmm. uh, reach out to more school opportunities. Um, some teachers have, you know, it's been made a decision that, they, that they're not um, in their best uh, professional capacity. And that's fine, that, that happens. And what are we doing with that? So I am interested, as is Dean Coleman, on the timing question of how we're doing continuing to hire as early in the process as well, how we're doing on the reviews. And I compliment, in particular, the proactive approach, for example, the diversity focus schools. Now, to me, that's something that your department has done that is respecting the mutual consent process. Mm -hmm but training school leaders on why this is important and why they can make a difference. And you're showing us the results that it does make a difference yep. versus just simply saying you must hire X, you must hire Y. Um, empowering our school leaders, pushing that to the school level so that they can decide the best team to have there, though I applaud superintendent, you asking that specific question. If a teacher isn't comfortable in a school, you want to know about the culture of that school. So. That's an important message to get out as well. Um, school leaders have heard me say over time, you try to change people. <coughs> in other words, you train them, you get them in the right position, or you change people. Mm -hmm. And they're out and someone else is in. And so um, I applaud the work of this department. It's not just about this results, though. It's a, this, this is a key piece of fundamentally how do we get the best students, uh, the best teachers in front of our students on a day in and day out basis. So I look forward to the rest of that data as well. No problem. I'm sure I'm not sure, Mr. Till, if you have any comments after you got into just fairly long talks. Just to say that I have built or will be building on the work of the two previous leaders, as you referenced. Um, I was Ross Wilson and Emily Quadrabath. I inherit a really, really good team, um, and we know we still have some work to do, but we're doing that work on a daily basis and. We look forward to making Boston one of the best places to work. Uh, and we're well aligned to the superintendent's agenda, so Thanks. we're very happy and, and proud. And you're going to have some challenges coming up, right? As we start you to know. expand six, uh, yep. six grades and as we shift around middle schools, that's all going to impact the teaching force. So having this good, solid base at the beginning is really important. I look forward to hearing in the future how you're going to be tackling those challenges as well. Look forward to reporting back. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, so I will start with good, too. And, um, you know, ditto to what everyone else has said about the diversity focused schools, <coughs> um, and particularly your comment around um, the hiring piece um, and changing the mindset, which I think is really important. Um, I do hiring all the time. And I can tell you that the best people that I have worked with are not the people that you traditionally think of that have you know all these accolades and mm -hmm. um, you have to look beyond. So I'm really happy that you articulated that and that that is going to be tra training for all schools because I think that's really important. There's a lot of gems that are just not shining mm -hmm. to the top even though they are shining through the world. Um, and the other piece um, also on, you know, I'm not a fan of them tell either, but I still want to say great job doing that because um, I know that that's like a huge barrier. Um, and then the high school to teacher pipeline, which I always talk about wherever I go. I just want to see that blow up and be ginormous. I think it's a great start. Um, I think the challenge still remains that um, <coughs> we can provide um, scholarships to go to school and um, we can provide a job, but we still have the issue of um, housing instability and living in this city. And so I think <coughs> we need to figure out what is the package, the complete package that we have. And it's not just our responsibility. Um, I think it's working with the city, working with our community. Um, I know there's places, um, I just found out about this organization called Landed. I don't know if you all, mm -hmm. I was. We're in talk, we're in oh conversations good. with them. I was them. like, this is a great idea. I've never heard of it. Um, mm -hmm. So doing things like that, but then I think there's so many 
you know, different things we could do if we look at the CDCs, what are they, they building? We're looking at like the hospitals right now who have put their money in when, they, when they're doing um, institutional expansion and community benefits and they're putting money towards housing issues. Mm -hmm. And so how can we use all of these things that we have to create that so that our students who, you know, have gone to school here, who would reflect the population, it's, you know, it's really like low hanging fruit. I know it will, won't yield for some time, mm -hmm. um, but I think looking at all those pieces. So I, enc I encourage us to continue to look at that. Um, the other piece is I saw all of some of the colleges, I'm sure there's more that you work with, and I'm wondering um, about working with RCC and Bunker Hill and how, m you know, I have many students I work with that go to those schools. Um, I, I think unfortunately, um, I think those are great schools. I'm a huge fan of Bunker Hill and not necessarily we always look at them in the best light, but we do have students that go to these schools and then they transition to other schools and so we work with them on that and so how can we also, you know, those are predominantly students of color who cannot afford or have not gotten into those traditional four-year uh, colleges and universities and how can we tap into that to have, I'm sure you're doing that, we're nodding, yes, yeah. We do have dual enrollment um, with our high school teacher at RCC. I'm nodding because it's it's absolutely right and in my head I'm thinking it's all about providing multiple access points to the end goal. Our partnership at City Year, we had one of our students, Nick, who came from, um, who did a year at City Year, was going to New England College, got a scholarship, a City Year scholarship to Bunker Hill, is now able to go for two years practically at no cost and he's looking to do his second, his second, you know, the last two years at UMass. So there's lots of different ways, and he wants to be a math teacher. So there are lots of different ways, and I'm just nodding with an affirmative. Yeah, yeah. So I would love to figure out how we explore um, those places. And I know you mentioned working with UMass at a master's level, but we also have a lot of you know, our BPS students that well, are at yeah. UMass, and so how do we work more closely uh, with them on that? Um, my, uh, my only comments are, you know, I don't want to, you know, be the downer because you've obviously been doing a great job for years, and we are a leader. But it's still disappointing. I can't, I can't sit up here and tell you, like, you know, going through the slides. It just pains me when I look at our student body, and I know it's a national <coughs> issue, and it's not just Boston, uh, but it is painful to see. And so, you know, I looked at like the slide of. Um, the uh, headmasters and principals, and that seems like a high turnover to me, if I'm reading that correctly, like the exits. Uh, when you look at like the Latino uh, population of principal headmasters, mm -hmm. it seemed like high to me. Um, and I wasn't really sure on the slide, um, the slide number seven that talked about maintaining a diverse workforce over time, if that captures, you know, um, educators that have left and been replaced. So it's kind of like a revolving door, like Ms. Robinson said. Mm -hmm. And so how do we make sure to, um, I, I know you're, I know you have efforts uh, on retention, but how do we even, how do we build, you know, how do we make that stronger? How do we make our retention stronger? Cause it seems like we're just working to get this crop and then, you know, to, to replace the ones that are leaving. And so it's like, we're like back in the same place. And mm -hmm. so, just figuring out like how do we t you know do um, better retention and I know we have specific smaller programs but figuring out how we can um, do that um, across the board. Um, those are so those are my. We agree with you. I just want to highlight um, this body has asked and the superintendent has requested us to to really think about the exit interview. Mm -hmm. um, Rashawn Martin has a very important role because it's about accessibility. So when you have someone who is challenging, having a challenging time, it's easily, he's easily accessible. The flip side is managing that churn that you're talking about. Our provisional teachers, by him being in contact, that 89% retention is the, the result of knowing who they are. Mm -hmm. So just keep holding us accountable with these different things and putting that in front. And each year I hope when we iterate that we're getting closer mm -hmm. to reaching, to knowing more and having solutions that match. Yep. Yep. In, in, yeah, go ahead. Oh, in terms of um, school leaders, um, so this past year, we had an opportunity to um, actually do those exit interviews. 
and to um, speak to school leaders. Um, and just being able to note some of those things. So then to think about this year, how to su support retention. So for instance, when a school leader needs to go out on paternity leave, we now provide from our office a retired principal to come in to support. And that's not money taken from their budget. That's something that we have worked out. So we're very grateful for that. Um, but then also too, in terms of hiring for this past year, thinking about the right fit. Um, each principal brings with them a set of skills. It may not be the right skills for that building, but might be the right ones for another building. So for our team to be just thoughtful about placement and who to present to a school for interviews, um, I think that will help us moving forward too as well. And also we're, um, we're going to bring together a team, including school leaders, to talk about how can we keep you here? What will make you happy? Because um, oftentimes a principal's job is a lonely job. And so noted in the exit, exit interviews is that they express that loneliness. So how can we connect to you? How can we show that we are invested in your success? So I know right now it doesn't have any immediate like result, but I think in the future it most definitely will. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up that point because I mean I, you know, we all talk to principals and we hear different stories. So it is important to make sure it is a really tough job, um, and making sure that we hear from them in terms of what kinds of support, and also you know, I I don't know what the policy is around some of some of our schools that are that just have larger challenges and do we have are there better are there higher incentives for principals to work there and can we provide that? So um, what we're in the process of doing, I feel like I'm like too close to this. Okay. <laughs> so what we're in the process of doing um, through the Office of Transformation is developing the duties and responsibilities for the transformation principal. And those are really different because those are in our most neediest schools. <laughs> but then also too, thinking about one, that job description, who can fit it, but then also the resources and support mm -hmm. it will take for that principal to be successful. Mm -hmm. So like that is coming out, we're excited about that work, and we're hoping that it'll, it will yield results for us. And I only have one more question, which is on slide number eight. I'm just curious on, um, <laughs> that you, s you s thank you for for um, putting a, um, a column on bowling staff because we've been asking for that. But I'm curious, when you take out the employees who are um, centrally budgeted but deployed to schools, yeah. not included in these figures? They're not included in any of these any of these columns? They are included in the um, column on the far right, the district total. The, um, district the challenge total. there is um, identifying exactly where they are assigned um, based on how they're tracked in our system. So um, folks who are budgeted centrally um, aren't necessarily in our system identified with um, a specific building. So an example might be um, uh, bus monitors. Um, so they are budgeted and w uh, they show up in our staffing roster associated with um, a central office department, not with a school that they might be assigned to. Okay, and I, I, I don't know how to say this. Um, it's not gonna sound nice, but I'm gonna say I don't know how to say it, but I'm just curious, when you take out the, when you take that out those employees because they uh, maybe not I don't know if the bus monitors would consider themselves central staff but for others that consider themselves central staff and they're deployed will the the numbers um, just um, look worse is basically what I'm trying to say when you add to this column so when you add that back in because we because one of the things we're looking we're talking about is the diversity we've said what is better, we right? can't say to the schools like you have to be diverse and then bowling is not diverse. So I'm just curious, if yeah. you added those numbers back into this column, what would it ultimately look like? I think it would actually look much more diverse. It would m look more diverse. Okay, we so were trying to, to that not that would just distort make it the numbers better. by including um, them here. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm always a conspiracy theorist, but uh, I just wanted to, <laughs> if you could send that to us, that would be really great. <laughs> yeah, because that's one of my next things. <laughs> that's why I said you better. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you. 
I just want to say thank, uh, send a quick note of thanks to uh, Mr. Taylor and his team uh, for uh, the presentation tonight. We know you um, worked very hard to put this comprehensive pre uh, presentation together for us, and uh, this is the product of conversation amongst the committee at the last retreat, and so we appreciate you being responsive uh, to that. And we've had this uh, presentation on an annual basis, but you know, each year I think it gets much more refined and responsive to um, not only the concerns that you hear articulated by the committee, but what we're hearing from the community um, and what we're hearing from you a, as to the um, specific programs that you're pursuing and um, efforts that you're making to try to um, better diversify and retain our uh, teacher workforce. So we're very appreciative of that, and um, we thank you for doing that. Okay. You're welcome. Superintendent, you have something further to say? I do. I just want to thank the team for their incredible work and for rising to the challenge of the work ahead. Um, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Taylor for stepping into the role uh, that Emily filled it so well. And I'm just really thrilled with the entire team and, and the work that the whole team is doing in, in our human capital office. A any district would be happy with these kind of numbers. And we have work to do. We know for what our goals are, especially with our Latinx teachers and workforce. That's our key area that we know because of the numbers of students that we serve for it to be reflective. I'm happy that the school committee and the community told me that this was one of their number one goals um, within the strategic direction. So they know that this is really critically important to us. It's important to the mayor. He has talked to me about it specifically as a goal for him. Um, and the workforce uh, of the city and this department as part of that. And so um, we are looking forward to the, <coughs> the current investments and rising current investments uh, in these efforts. I believe that our future teachers in Boston are in our classrooms right now. I think that's our best chance of having mm -hmm. children who are linguistically proficient, who understand the BPS culture, who are culturally and racially diverse um, and who are competent and ready to go. And uh, if we could just get 10% of our graduating class, that would mm -hmm. fill mm -hmm. our vacancies mm -hmm. each year. So we only need to convince 10%. So I'm calling on all of our Boston public school teachers <laughs> to start talking to every single student about becoming a Boston public school teacher. I know that's what I do when I go out and I see <coughs> kids. Some of them say, <coughs> no way but others are inspired, like Elvis <laughs> Rodriguez, my, my intern, you know, he's like, no way, now he's like, I think I wanna work with you in the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. So um, let's go out and do our part in, in the recruitment. That's right. <laughs> That's right, I am, I'm always trying to recruit. But another thing too is I think also, our workforce that we have with our bus monitors and our paraprofessionals and our custodians and our nutrition workers, they love our kids, and many times they're very diverse uh, backgrounds, and I would love to find ways to have a step-up program for our paraprofessionals um, to, to get them into our classrooms uh, and certified. Mm -hmm. So thank you guys very much for all that you're doing. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you again. We'll look forward to future updates. We'll move on now to our final and uh, brief report, an update on the process for the time and timeline, excuse me, for the uh, superintendent's performance evaluation. Do you want me to go down there? You can stay up here, Dr. Okay. Coleman. Um, so work the um, monitor. Xavier, could you help? Well, us? maybe, well, <laughs> if you want to go through the, uh, the slide deck, it might actually be uh, easier to move it through there. Um, so pardon me for that. Uh, um, interrupted uh, um, uh, introduction. So uh, we're moving on. Uh, this final report is an update on the process and timeline for the superintendent's performance evaluation for school year 1920. Nobody and uh, this will be a brief um, summary of uh, where we're at in the process. And um, you know, just as a reminder for uh, folks that are watching at home, uh, the bo the school committee has uh, four uh, defined statutory. Um, functions. Uh, one is to define uh, the vision, mission, and goals of the BPS, uh, and that's something that we've done through the strategic planning process over the last few months in partnership with the superintendent. Uh, the second is to uh, establish and uh, review an uh, annual operating budget, which we'll be embarking on next week. Uh, 
Third is to uh, set and um, uh, monitor uh, district policies. And the fourth is to hire, uh, manage, and evaluate the superintendent. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. We haven't done one of these in a number of years. Uh, and so uh, the um, Dr. Coleman, our colleague, has um, taken it upon himself to um, take a, a fresh look at what DESE requires of us and try to um, uh, manipulate this process so that it works for uh, the district and the unique uh, circumstances presented by Boston that don't exist elsewhere uh, in the Commonwealth. So over the last few months, uh, Dr. Coleman has been working with the superintendent uh, to lay out this process and timeline, and he's ready to present that uh, to us this evening. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Coleman. Thanks. You have a memo in your packet as well as the slide deck. I just want to let you know how intimidating you guys look from down here, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I want to also start with Dr. Sellers has been a wonderful partner and, and, and collaborator in this, and I think one of the things that uh, she's made very clear and I think we need to, to grow is that this is really is a iterative process and a collaborative process. And so as we go through the steps that uh, we're discussing, your feedback, your ideas are, are deeply are, are, are desired and I think we will refine this uh, as, we, as we use it. So um, one of the things that uh, we want to make very clear is that, and, and actually uh, Ms. Robinson and I were having this conversation earlier, that the, we want to align the evaluation of the superintendent with the strategic vision of the, of the schools and so we want to start with that. It also has to be aligned with the work that she is doing with her staff. Uh, the evaluation needs to address both annual performance expectations and provide ultimately the basis for reappointment, which is uh, within in the next uh, uh, in the three years, whenever uh, whatever the length of the appointment that it should build towards uh, the information that we use for reappointment when her term is finished. Uh, the evaluation needs to be focused on the pro on her professional performance and the performance of the district. So we have to find a way to bring both of those elements forward. So this presentation will outline a procedure that uh, uh, we're proposing may, may, may accomplish these goals. Right, so the, the evaluation will have three parts. One part will be a report on the professional performance of the superintendent. The second will be a report on her educational development plan. So uh, when she finishes the year, and then the third will be reported on the SMART goals that we collaboratively uh, uh, develop with the superintendent. And so the annual timeline for the uh, process will be a report on the professional um, uh, performance will be in the May school committee meetings. Uh, and then the report on both the SMART goal attainment and the educational plan would be uh, included in the last uh, meeting in May. Um, um, and that would all, and the SMART goal uh, report would also be a proposed educator development plan for the uh, following year. Um, the, we, as the school committee, would then take that information and we would work together to develop a, a, a feedback on both the, the, the portfolio and the SMART goal attainment and the educator development plan, and that would be presented to the superintendent by uh, June. And then by the end of June, we would have to approve on, an, and then and we have to figure out exactly, once we give that feedback to the superintendent, exactly who would work to develop a, uh, a consensus agreement with the superintendent about what that final evaluation. I think that's something we have to think about and, and plan on. And then um, by the end of June, we would want to have a final approval of both the annual evaluation, the SMART goals, and then the superintendent's uh, educator development plan for the following year. This is a very similar process that she's outlined with her staff, so this would be kind of a way to keep it coordinated. And then the, the next part of the proposal is that the in the last year of the superintendent's uh, term appointment that we would engage in a more formal, organized 360 evaluation process, uh, which we all, which all Every executive uh, who goes to this summit panics because as, as, as the superintendent pointed out, this may become right in the middle of some uncomfortable school decisions. And I pointed out that my 360 came after I closed the department. So we all know that those are panic moments if you're an executive. But it's, so it's our responsibility to understand that there's going to be a diversity of responses no matter what a superintendent does. And it's part of our job to uh, take that into account as we read the information. 
So I want to go through or just present or put in the record with some detail what would be these categories of uh, professional performance. And I think the superintendent has done a, a wonderful job of working to align what the domains are with what the state expectations are. So um, they, the domains are, are here. I, I, won't, I won't read them all there. But the first one is understands the role and responsibilities of the superintendent. So what would be the evidence that would be developed to demonstrate that she, she has that understanding? Second, there's a commitment to academic excellence and innovation. Again, these are, these are indicators of what that could look like. And then what would be the evidence that you would bring forward? Um, the third one is productivity, organizing, and planning. Fiscal responsibility and budget control. Judgment decision making. Um, collaboration, teamwork, and focus on equity and excellence, and communication and personal skills. So this would be uh, the superintendent would work with us to develop a uh, set of evidence in each one of these domains that would be presented to us in May, uh, and, and, and again, uh, with, with uh, deep admiration and respect, the superintendent is eager to do that in this room as a public event, and which I think is a very a uh, brave, courageous, and appropriate decision in a, in a district where we're trying to build trust and good communication that she's willing to come and present the, uh, on, on half the domains one meeting and the other half the domains another meeting in May so that we can discuss this in public and respond to it. I think it's a, it's a, it's a remarkably uh, courageous and appropriate professional decision. Um, and then from that, from that portfolio, would also emerge the areas of strengths that she would want to enhance, and then the also the areas of uh, growth that she would identify and develop a plan in two or three areas of strength, two or three areas of continuing growth. So that would also be presented in, in, uh, in May. And then each year, and this is, this is, this is I think, one of the uh, complicated processes in this evaluation, that in addition to <coughs> professional competence and development, there's also some goals that we need to have for the superintendent that would be, let's put them in, in numerical form and they using the SMART goal approach that we've discussed uh, 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 regularly, that there would be some agreement on what are the two, three, two or three SMART goals that we want to hold the uh, superintendent accountable for. And these would be those leading um, changes that we expect to have in the district in order to achieve our, our, our more lasting goals. And that, that progress in those goals would be part of the uh, annual evaluation. And then, as, as I suggested earlier, the next part would not be every year, but uh, um, depending on the term of appointment. So as I understand it, the superintendent has a three-year appointment. So in the third year, the spring of the third year, we would engage in a 360 evaluation to kind of give a more rich understanding of what the community and her colleagues and her, her, um, 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 her the people who report to her are seeing with some of the strengths and uh, opportunities in her performance. So that is a proposal in the process and we look forward to entertaining your questions. Well, thank you for that uh, very brief summary. Uh, Dr. Coleman, I'm not sure how you were able to, uh, you know, boil that down so uh, neatly uh, with all the, uh, the months of work that you put into this along with uh, the superintendent. But thank you very much for all this work and for laying it out so clearly. Uh, we're going to ask our members to uh, start with questions. I'll start with Dr. Rivera and we'll go from there. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. This is great. Um, <clears throat> so I was just curious, um, do, do we as school committee members do that self-evaluation that's part of what the everybody else does or how do we also evaluate our role in terms of how we're supporting the superintendent or I'm not even sure if that's a part of this process. It's a brilliant question. I think that one of the things that we need to consider as a body is how formally we're going to evaluate our performances and how we're, how supportive we are, the superintendent of the school of district's progress, and what what that should be and what that should look like. Um, I clearly have ideas about that, but that's not necessarily the focus of the of, of this conversation. But I think that should be something that, as we think of, uh, in addition to superintendent, what are what are the indicators for our success, both as uh, as committee as a whole, 
and also as individual committee members. I think that's a lot of boards do that, where you have to do an annual self-evaluation. Uh, you have your goals and you do self-evaluation. That's not necessarily built into here, but I think that would be a brilliant addition to what we do. Um, I think the city council would like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they would. Um, <coughs> with the SMART goals, um, or the three high-level goals, how could those actually be some of the same goals that are in the strategic plan, even though there's more than three? But would we be narrow, like focusing on three of those goals that are in gonna be in the strategic plan? Or I'm just As proposed, the system would ask us to work with the superintendent to identify in, in the strategic plan at this period in time, what are those three uh, high priority drivers of change that we are expecting to happen? Doesn't mean the others stop being important, and we may say all five. I mean, we if we really want to um, be, you know, overly demanding, we could say we want smart goals for every domain. But I, I'm not sure that would lead to uh, the type of focus that is necessary. But we that's part of the conversation. We'd have to say here are the three that are our priority. We think these three are the ones that really need change, um, because that's we're convinced that's what's going to create the system improvement we're expecting. And we need to build consensus around that. And that's part of our conversation. And but which then, as you suggest, would lead us to being more articulate and responsible for what we're looking for. So the educator development plan, um, does that mean that Dr. Caselius has to also do like professional development herself? Or is that the educator development plan that she's developing for teachers. I'm, I'm curious, is it for you or for? She had a brilliant answer. Uh, the, uh, this is up to, uh, she, she gave the question that you gave a great answer on the phone the other day about what you, an example of areas that you think you want to have improving. Well, I don't think I want to put out the areas I want to improve in yet because I might <laughs> change my mind, but um, but I, it's where I will be, do, I will be doing the work. So there will absolutely be professional development for me. For instance, you know, yesterday I was asked about EL, and um, you know, what are what am I going to do to improve the instruction for EL? I am not an expert in EL, and so I said, and I said in my interview, but I'll hire that expert. But I also want to become an expert, and so I have to do professional development in order to become better at understanding the best strategies in order to get at the achievement of our EL students in many different ways. And then specifically, specifically, I want to focus on EL and special ed when they have both. Mm -hmm. That's one area um, that I'd like to get some additional professional development on. Mm -hmm. But there are multiple, I mean, there's many ways I need to grow, but um, that's one of them. And theoretically, it would be tied into what are, the, what are the areas that we all agree we need to grow as a district and what what would be the learning and learning. that one specifically goes right to el achievement mm -hmm. for students right and so mm -hmm. that would then tie into what is a strategic goal as well so i'm going to try to find some of those but then there might be also personal development ones yeah. for my own personal leadership um. yeah no um, on monday the department of youth services had a conference over 300 attendees all professional development and it was focused on racial trauma mm -hmm and addressing racial trauma in education and teaching resilience, so yeah. I highly recommend that. Um, so my, my last question is, um, this, this written report, will we all be writing pieces of that, or, um, you know, and that would be due in June, June 10th? Yeah, the, the, the proposal would be, you know, we would get the evidence, we would get the professional portfolio domains shared with us before it's presented. We would review them, and then in between uh, um, a meeting in May, we need to figure out exactly, and this is something, this is, a, this is a part of the technology we have to build, we'd have to figure out exactly how each of us would contribute to a final um, report, so there would be a written, so this is, um, We've done, we'd gone this through this before, and we had an amazing amount of detail in the previous 
evaluations we did, but uh, hopefully this will be a cleaner, more straightforward. Uh, we'll probably have a set of uh, guiding questions that for each domain <coughs> that we would respond to, and then each of us would um, make a response, and then whether it's the vice chair, chair, or designated member of the committee, probably uh, the person uh, organizing it would then bring that and summarize it to present as a document for all of us to review. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. And um, Ms. Sullivan, perhaps if you could take uh, the last um, uh, review that we did for Dr. Chang and, and share that with uh, Dr. Rivera for her review. You know, a lot of what um, Dr. Coleman's put together here in partnership with uh, Dr. Caselius is um, uh, new domains, um, a, a new way of focusing on um, the work that um, uh, the superintendent's done and what we expect her to do. Um, and I think there's probably some process pieces in there that are new as well, but the baseline work that we do where each of us um, contribute an individual evalu evaluation and those get amalgamated into a composite evaluation that represent what um, the uh, committee's consensus evaluation is of the superintendent is a process that we need to go through that's um, just part of the requirements of how we conduct these annual reviews. So this will give you the previous reviews will give you a sense of, of how we've done that in the past. That would be great. Thank and you I'm so much. Try, I'm working, I'm thinking very hard about how to do this all digitally. I don't want to touch paper. <laughs> I didn't want to obligate you to anything just yet, but I think uh, that's that would be a huge leap forward for us. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Robinson. Yes. Um, first, I want to thank Dr. Coleman for <coughs> taking a stab at getting this organized in a very quite humane way. Um, uh, two questions. One harkens back to the past. Um, when it was a very cumbersome process of the myriads of amounts of material that had to be gathered and, you know, that we were confronted with trying to read and make sense of in a very short period of time. And so my, my sense is that may not happen in the same way moving forward. Um, I mean, I know this you know, we can talk so to be brought together, but yes. it was, um, yeah. One of my areas of scholarship <coughs> is uh, portfolio perf uh, assessment of performance. And you can put together a portfolio with artifacts where the real focus is the uh, <coughs> superintendent's commentary about her competence. That was what was lacking right. in the previous one. We had all this data, and there was no statement about, here's the skill I'm trying to demonstrate, right. and this is what I think about my skill. And, and you'll see this, the, the superintendent already has with her team, they say, here's how I am meeting my goals, and here's my self-evaluation. And then we get to respond to the self-evaluation. We don't have to individually evaluate what mm -hmm. each of the individual artifacts mean. The superintendent will summarize her self-evaluation. We'll see the data, and we'll be able to then say, that makes sense to me, or yes and, or yes but. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's a little bit of, of both. I think that we'll see some evidence, you know, for instance, this year I will present the strategic plan as evidence of the community engagement. You'll have the right. number of meetings and um, feedback. I have notes that people have written to me. Um, you know, there's some personal, so I hope to be able to tell a more personal story about my entry into Boston um, and then provide some pieces of evidence this year. Next year, I think the evidence would be more robust because then we'll have you know year-end results. We'll have um, tied to the strategic plan what those results are. I will have um, goals that will be specific to my professional development that I'll be able to go more in depth with. But this first inaugural year, I think will look a little different than year two and then year three, I think would be kind of the culmination of, well, how did the first three years go? So that will be more of a multi-measure over multiple years. Um, <coughs> so I think every year it may look just a little bit different. Um, and I think that uh, Dr. Coleman has given me the um, opportunity to be able to tell a story more so over three years um, than a very rigid process. I think one more that feels much more collaborative with the school committee. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Coleman, for your work on this. Just two quick questions. One, I'm struggling with the domain number three, productivity, organizing, and planning. And I know it, it does correspond to the DESE standard 
and it's a DESI standard for a superintendent, right? Because some of these things just sound, frankly, silly to me to have on a superintendent's evaluation. And I know you're taking off the, but for example, organize, appropriately organizes work so others can find work in progress and or necessary files and information. Or meets deadlines, demonstrates effective time use and simultaneous handling of several assignments. I mean, <laughs> superintendent, I mean, you, you know, you, you know what I mean, right? It's. Yep. I'm surprised that the DESE even has some of these things as touch yep. points for a superintendent. I think some of these align to DESE, but then also some are aligned to what I'm expecting of my team members. So because we've aligned also to my team members, we're looking at both. And these are things that I should also be able to do. I should be able to get back to people within 24 hours. I, I you know, I should be able to calendar my requests and manage my request to calendar even though I don't manage my entire calendar and actually they've kicked me out of my calendar. <laughs> 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 we have all learned not to ask you uh, <laughs> about it because your answer will immediately be yes. Yeah, I'll, That's I'll right. um, unfortunately, so they're not 46 <laughs> hours in a day. Right. So, uh, so since this is, you know, the initial proposal, so yeah. those are exactly, we love for each of you to go through and mark up and just yeah. kind of give us a, you know, this this seems like a minor, this seems that is this really necessary? Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly, exactly what we would hear. And then and maybe we can come back and say, you know, we'll, we'll get bigger, bigger font for the major ones in the area right. and the small font. We can, we can I, do that. Having been through this before, I hate the thought of the superintendent and her team wasting time on developing artifacts and giving us a book this thick that knows that shows that she can simultaneously handle several assignments. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the you handle more assignments in the morning than most people mm -hmm. do in a month. So uh, that's the nature of the job. So if we can try to, you know, wean it down, that's more time for the superintendent to spend actually running the district versus trying to develop artifacts for us That's on right. some of those things. I, I, I'll put this in the language, uh, nerdy language. We want the appropriate level of abstraction. You don't want to get too much detail, but there's a how, wh what's that level of abstraction? And that's what we want to work on now. What's the level of abstraction we really want? And whether she managed her candle calendar well or not is not a level, a detail that we're particularly interested. But what does that mean in terms of organization? Yeah. What, yeah. what a real, what would be an example of being organizing herself in a productive way? And as, as Dr. Celius has pointed out, the whole um, visiting every school in mm -hmm. a period of time is, and keeping the district and nothing falling apart in the district is a remarkable example of uh, productivity, well organized and good planning so she could accomplish that goal for us all while also uh, hiring new people and get things going. Yeah. So I think that's the level of abstraction more than our calendar. So I think we agree with you. In some cases I struggle with how, how you can actually show an artifact to prove a point. So I bring you to domain number seven, focus on equity and excellence. Mm -hmm. Okay, supports and actively builds a culture of excellence and equity. Well, that's gonna be the strategic plan, that's all the implementation. But then when you get to all the way to ensures that all contact, whether by telephone, email, or mail with colleagues, families, and students is positive and productive in nature, constructive criticism followed by problem solving suggestions. I'm not even sure how you show that as an artifact. Well, I, I, I actually have a couple already in my portfolio. It's like responses to parents who are angry or upset, okay. and then how I respond to them um, genuinely and authentically and uh, in a timely way and resolve the, the matter. Um, and so I can, I have a couple of those already that demonstrate uh, that specific thing because I think that is one of the most important things to building culture is our tone and how we actually um, speak to others and how we really earnestly try to resolve their issues. Not that I just hand them off to someone else and have them, you know, resolve it for me. Yep. Typically it's, uh, you know, if I do have to give it to someone else to resolve, then I follow up typically with an email to that person. I, I so can I understand? Can I give an example yes, of, of how course. that may be resolved? I think so. And Dr. Caselius has made a huge commitment to m make us a customer-oriented um, um, customer district. service, yep. and that's part and that's built into her theory of equity and excellence. Mm -hmm. And so, within that framework evidence that she would provide of doing that would be 
speed of response to customer issues and complaints as a way of building trust. So I think, I think that will be, as the artifacts are presented, we will work to make sure that you're not overwhelmed with you know, reading 30, 30, 40 emails that she sent out, but exemplars of that work. Yeah. I'm just, and Superintendent, this is not personal to you. Mm -hmm. I'm just plain devil's advocate sure. of having done evaluations in the past. You could present us with 100 artifacts. And by the way, I know your policy is quite often when we all get an email from parents, you are replying in clappiness, so we do see it in action. The devil's advocate in my head that says, you're going to show us what presents that light. And again, I'm, I'm not personalizing mm -hmm. it to you. Please mm -hmm. don't take it that way. Someone else in your role could have other types of interactions that we're not aware of um, that would come out, say, for example, in a 360 feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just I'm I'm struggling with how an artifact fits to that. I'm agreeing completely with the whole way that you're going with the domains, and obviously the first year is different from the other years. And that kind of brings me to my last question. And I'm sorry for not um, picking this up clearly in your presentation, Dean Coleman. Are we going to be agreeing on smart goals for this year? Or were these domains in effect to SMART goals for this year? Um, well, I don't think we have SMART goals yet for this year. What we'll be doing is agreeing for the SMART goals going forward. For this year, there won't be, I mean, we'll talk about goal acquisition uh, because there are some plans and goals like the strategic plans done yeah. that visit. But in terms of SMART goals, that's going to be articulated for the next year. So this year, we because we didn't start the year with them, yep. it would be I think I think it would be inappropriate to kind of lay them on now, um, you know, this late in the game. I know Desi gives us great flexibility in the first year of a superintendent's evaluation. Do we have the flexibility to not have smart goals in the first year? I don't think smart goals is is in their language. They they they, they just talk about goals, and we can. Uh, I think the superintendent can has already articulated some of the goals. She oh has yeah, I mean we can there. easily say some already. You know, it's the visiting the <coughs> schools, it's the strategic plan, it's the development of the first budget, it's yeah. introduction to the community. There, I got four for you already that you're doing pretty well on. <laughs> Check. Uh, Check. Um, well, let's so just pick the ones that I'm going to do well on then. <laughs> <laughs> No, there are we'll some we'll others as well one. that we we'll can think of, one. but right. <laughs> uh, you, I, you see the point that I was getting at. In the first year, are we having some, or is it more just these domains that we have laid out? It's going to be more, we'll start with the portfolio professional performance yes. this year, from which we'll develop an educator development plan for the next year, and then articulate the SMART goals we hold for her for the next year. So okay. this year, it's going to be mostly focused on the portfolio of professional performance. Right. Thank you for leading this work. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Vice Chair. Thank you. Thank you for doing all this work. I know it was a lot. Um, <coughs> I agree with um, some of the points. My, my, uh, my goal is not to look at as many artifacts as I've looked at in the past, <laughs> so that's all I have to say about that. Um, my only other comment is, um, for going forward in the future, because one of the things we talked about um, in the past was around the evaluation of the academic piece, but then the evaluation around build BPS, and so how does that fit in in the long term? So, as as uh, the superintendent has said repeatedly, and I think we've uh, this is an iterative process. So that's a great, that's exactly the type of qu design question that I think we're going to have to work through. But how do you separate what's the more easily acquirable data, such as um, 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 school, uh, the, uh, performance in the school quality framework, and then what's more, um, is it not necessarily subjective data, but what's less uh, easily summarized with a number, effective implementation would build BPS. Mm -hmm. So those are very different, um, um, equally important bits of parts of the performance of the district, but how we represent their outcomes can be different. And that's part of what we have to discuss and become comfortable with. Um, important now at a design and figuring it out process, super important as we determine the goals for the following because this is, this is kind of a design early part in the process. And, and then we're going to go through a build BPS. We're going to have some strong reactions. Both we're going to have reactions. The community's going to have reactions. Staff's going to have reactions. 
and then we from that we collectively have to form some real expectations about what's going forward for the mm -hmm. next year so that we're all clear about what we think is good and what we don't think is good i don't think we can say that right now because yeah. we it's still so no does that make sense no i no i totally agree i just want to put it out there and i and i'm not saying that we have to evaluate the superintendent or not i'm just putting on the table as something for us to discuss because i just want it to be crystal clear for all of us um so that we don't you know in the past we we all had very um strong feelings um about um dr chang's evaluation and that not being included and so whether I just think as a body we need to decide if if that is part of it or not, um, and how and it is different in how we're evaluating. Very good. We should pick Dave. Yeah. I mean, I know it's early. I just want to put it out there. No, I know. I, I, this yeah. is exactly when uh, this is the time for us to. This is a proposal, and details we want to add to it are what we need right now. Did you guys say anything further? Nope. Um, thank you for that, uh, Vice Chair. And you know, I think that you know some of the uh, you mentioned this to me earlier as well. And I think some of the the essence of what your concerns are is uh, uh, fall on you know what's qualitative versus what's quantitative. And um, I think a lot of the aspects of what we expect of the leadership in the district around um, the big ticket items like um, whole system change that's represented by Bill BPS and grade reconfiguration and the rest of it um, is much more qualitative than quantitative and, um, you know, put it another way, we know it when we see it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if we focus on, a and uh, I appreciate you raising this issue, I think if we focus on the process aspects of um, that qualita those qualitative outcomes, um, if we know that the superintendent is communicating with the community um, if we know that she's established a process to take input and uh, work through on a regular basis um, the the changes that um, we've identified we want in this district to to serve uh, better outcomes uh, then I think we can we can use that as the measuring stick for and we can develop the artifacts around that um, to, to determine whether or not um, those goals have been met but go to domain number five. I can't. I'm, I'm sorry. It's not. It's not still clicking up there. I don't, I don't know if you see it here, but that's not showing for the for the people. With. So don't. I would think judgment decision making uh, identifies and evaluates issues, reaches sound decisions, generates alternatives. Yep. Then if, if we look, if we looked and said, if at one point as you're going through the um, in May, saying and let's take Bill BPS. You don't. That's an example of you thought it's poorly, poorly identified. Sound decision was not made. Uh, no good alternatives. That's when you and your response get to say no, not 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 meeting my expectations. Mm -hmm. right. And you would then give an example mm -hmm. um, as to why you don't think what you and that'd be part of when you go through the uh, work saying. Now this is, from my experience, this is where I am. And then we would bring that together. So, and it could also be under domain four, because we could look at yeah. fiscal responsibility. I'm just saying that as we move forward, is I just want us to decide mm -hmm. if that's what we're doing. Because when, when I go and fill this out, I don't, I, I want to fill it out looking at it. I'm either looking at this in a viewpoint of academics and how, you know, how we've moved the needle or am I looking at this as academics and Bill BPS? So I'm not, we don't have to decide right now, but I just want to put it out Great there. Great question. Um, and I also want to say that I, I really like the 360 feedback. Mm -hmm. I know that was sorely missing, I felt like. I, I think as a leader, you can't really grow if you don't actually have feedback from the people that you're working most closely with. So. I do think that there will be pieces of evidence like the strategic plan or Bill BPS that hits multiple domains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would, I think it would be in the story and the way that I talked about the different commitments and uh, commitments to different mm -hmm. um, domains within that piece of evidence mm -hmm. and how you exhibit the different, um, you know, judgment or uh, collaboration or budgetary controls or operations, mm -hmm. you know, all of that, uh, all of these demands really actually hit Bill PPS, mm -hmm. right? So. No, they definitely do. So I guess what I'm saying though is like then it'll we be should less just less we should just <laughs> decide as a body like if that if it's all encompassing. What's mm -hmm. I do realize it hits that, but I just 
because usually, you know, you hire a superintendent to do the academic work. You're not hiring them to do the full facilities. That's not usually, right? But in our case, we have all these old buildings and we have all these issues of transportation, et cetera. So I just want to know for my own self, like when I'm doing the evaluation that I'm thinking about the whole. In, interesting. Whole I, 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 I was assuming it was the whole ball of wax. Yeah. I, yeah, well, I wasn't assuming that because I mean, no, no, but you understand. I mean, I, I hear you. I hear you. But I, so I would say, from where I sit, um, you know, it's 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 a complex, yeah. demanding. This is why mm -hmm. very few people succeed at doing this well over time, mm -hmm. because there's so many bits and pieces, and this is get to articulate mm -hmm. where we are and explain and have expectations for growth rather than panic if we're not getting it all at once. What I might suggest is the way that we think about this is um, we haven't traditionally obligated superintendents to present certain artifacts, certain defined yeah. artifacts. And I think if we're thinking about build BPS as something that crosses a number of domains, we think about how we obligate the superintendent to provide evidence that she has specifically um, moved the needle on um, in this area or you know a number of defined areas that might not link up to any one specific domain mm -hmm. so I think that's fair fair play for further conversation and I think Mr. Going you back to what I think is the impressive part about the superintendent's willingness to present these domains in public is not only will we be able to respond but the communities can respond and say well hey what about this and then that has to be integrated into our response, so I think it's, I think it's part of what I think is courageous and brave, but also will make it more meaningful <coughs> and useful for all of us. Mr. O'Neill, you had something to add. Uh, two quick things. One, I think maybe a way to slice it. I think what you're getting at is in each of the domains, we look at it in in how is the superintendent doing in these domains from an academic viewpoint, how is it from an operational viewpoint, and maybe how is it from a finance or personnel or strategic viewpoint that would include like BPA, a long range viewpoint, right? So short term operation, long term operation. Mm -hmm. Just a, so that there's a different, you use those lenses for each of the domains. <coughs> that may be a way to slice it. And I just, I'd want to strictly say as both Dr. Coleman and I were talking with the Office of Human Capital before about how important it is that uh, teachers have a, our professionals have evaluations, our school leaders have it, our senior staff, the superintendent. Quite frankly, Mr. Chair, I would love to see us implement a self-assessment mm -hmm. as a school board as well. That's a best practice for school boards nationally as we learned at Harvard. How often do you do self-evaluations yourself? And I think in the spirit of kicking off with this superintendent's evaluation process, we should consider doing a self-evaluation ourselves maybe sometime during the summer something to consider. I think that's uh, uh, absolutely something that we can talk about at a, uh, a future retreat. Dr. Rivera, you had something to add as Just well. Just a real quick question about uh, where, what happens after we do the report, the evaluation. Like, does it go to the mayor, for example, or what you know, sort of? We vote on it. It's, okay. it's publicized. OK. And then, so um, I'll just ask. like. Does the mayor's office have any role in this evaluation? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it is one of our four tenants. That's right. Okay. Well, we look forward to uh, continuing this discussion. As you, as you can see, uh, Dr. Coleman and <coughs> Dr. Caselius have uh, laid out a uh, pretty uh, ambitious um, schedule for us for later this spring. Uh, we'll hope to keep to that. Uh, we put that on the tentative calendar for May and June. And um, once again, thanks for all this work, and we look forward to continuing this conversation. Ms. Sullivan reports, uh, excuse me. Mr. Mudd. Public comment on reports. Please step forward. Sorry to keep you late, but <coughs> I, I can't do justice to the human capital report, you know, that's that's very thoughtful and detailed, but I have a few broad brush comments to, to that I think is important to get out. I believe we are and should be way beyond Garrity. My understanding is that it is school committee policy that the teacher diversity should match student diversity in this system. 
And uh, if, if this has changed, then I think everybody needs to know it. And if it hasn't changed, then I think also people around this building need to realize that we have still huge gaps. The goals of Garrity were developed in the 1970s, for, uh, you know, and if you compare, you have 33% blacks, 21% teachers. You have 43% Latinos and 11% maybe Latino teachers. I mean, that's a huge, huge difference. And if, I, I will leap. I mean, the message I got from this committee was that you guys were satisfied. You thought it was terrific what was happening. And that, uh, you know, the, the data that shows we've maintained and another way of looking at that is we haven't made progress in black or Latino hiring for, what, a decade? Now, are we satisfied with that? I, I, as an advocate, I'm not. I view it with some urgency and with some desire to see some really significant, I, in my discussions with superintendent, I think you'd view it that way. So what, if, what are those dramatic changes? that are going to bring us you know, a difference that's going to move the needle. I have suggested here, and I've suggested privately to many people, that in addition to the racial and ethnic gaps, we need a language gap. Mm -hmm. We are sitting here with a system that has, I, I don't even have it in my own for me, I think over half our students come from a home where English is not the home language, we have 40% or so that are ELs, former ELs, or, or so on. This is a huge, huge issue. And I believe that a language gap needs to be up there for districts and schools just the way we have a racial gap. There's data. I've seen reports on schools. Well, let's see it. Unless you don't believe it. I mean, I, I'm, I feel like I'm throwing it in the wind. But I think it's profoundly important. Sorry to go over, uh, to be continued. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mudd. <laughs> new, uh, new business members? Well, that concludes the business for this evening. Our next school committee meeting is next week on Wednesday, no, uh, February 5th at 6 p.m., at which time the superintendent will present her FY21 budget recommendation. If there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Looks like unanimous consent. Good night. Okay.